Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Pure Mix live stream. Today, we're here with the amazing Michael Brower to answer any remaining questions about the Browerizing video and, of course, everything else about his incredible career. So, hello, Michael. And, of course, Fernando, Fernando. my right hand man. Hello. Um, yeah, I, you know, this was a very complicated method. And uh, the fact that we spent a lot of time to present this video to you, and I think we covered so much of it in different ways, as I started seeing some comments or questions to my email, um, well, the first thing was we hadn't actually ever calibrated ABCD. So we came back, went back in and did that. And of course, since most of you now have been using it for a while, now you're really getting to understand how this tool works. It's an engine. And so I thought it was important to come back and, and just really finalize what some of the questions have been because, again, it's a complicated system, but it, it really is just a tool. It's just an engine. And some of these questions that, that we've been reading, you're, you're getting a little bit more focus on the technical than it's supposed to be just you got to ride certain things. And, and so you, it's a starting point, but it's not if you put this exact number in, this tone or something, you're supposed to get that. It's, it's supposed to be done with music. And again, it's just a, a, a process of, of allowing you to get more emotional with your mixing. So that's how you have to keep it in mind. It's just that it's a tool and you use what you like from it. And sometimes you may, you know, want to adapt and change. But again, it's just a tool. So with that in mind, uh, there's a few things that I, I think we can maybe refine or modify or actually, you know, somewhat, maybe we didn't really bring up something that we, you know, Fernando and I just assumed was actually the, the, the process. So first thing is very, very important to understand is that, as you know, this is all about mixing into compression. So it's post-compression mixing. And that starts right from the very beginning. The sound source going into the folders, which back then would have been, um, as far as Back when I started, it was the tape machine, tape machine going to the desk. Um, and then the, you know, the faders going to my ABCD. So if you aren't getting the first part of this correct, the gain staging into the folders, you're going to have issues. You're either going to be over compressing or under compressing. Because again, once you get the folders in and then you're you want the faders coming back in a nice sweet spot. You don't want to be mixing where the faders are all the way at the top or all the way at the bottom. You want to be in a nice place right around zero on the fader. Then you're now feeding into the ABCD. And admittedly, yes, this all seems really complicated, but once you set it up right, it's just an engine under the hood. You don't have to do anything at that point. Now you're just driving. And that's, the, you have to get passed through that, get familiar with, with how this engine works. Mm -hmm. And then forget about it. Or as we say in New York, forget, forget about it. You, you don't, you know, just mix, right? So today we're gonna go through a lot of the questions. Um, I'll answer some, anything that goes technical, I will hand over to Fernando, <laughs> who certainly understands this approach better than anyone. Um, I mean, he's, you know, he's my protege and, and he's been mixing this way and he hears, he hears certain things. And I think sometimes maybe if I'm saying something, he might want to interject and say, you know, throw his two cents in, into all this because it's important that today we try to, you know, help tweak some of what is going on. And uh, this will probably be the final episode, but um, I want to spend the next couple hours, you know, addressing very good questions. 
and and rightly so because again it is it's a different way of mixing it's a different way of hearing but for those who've had the patience and the commitment to do it this way i think you're all seeing really cool benefits that are more emotional that you can express yourself a little bit better um, and that's what this is about. It's just a tool for your creativity. And it's one where there's hardly a any, a any limitation to, to the options. It's just a hundred options. And it depends on what kind of music you're mixing, how you're gonna apply certain things, right? So with that in mind, let's get it going. Awesome. All right, so here's how we're gonna do this today. We sent out an email to everybody, letting you guys know about the live stream, along with the link where you could pre-submit a question. So from the pre-submissions, we got a whole lot of questions and we pared it down to about 45-ish, uh, which is a lot of questions. And we still wanna get to some questions in the live chat as well. So everybody in the chat room, we see you, we're gonna get to your questions too, but we're gonna start the day off with just going through uh, sort of rapid fire style, I think, to try and get to as many as we can. Um, with the pre-submitted. So our first question comes from Georgios in Athens, Greece. And he says, now that you've moved to a smaller room, you find you, do you find yourself having more fun mixing um, or do you prefer the sound of a full treated room? To your well, the room that I'm in is probably one of the best mixing rooms <laughs> I've ever been in. Um, it's small, it probably is uh, against the normal acoustic uh, rules. It's a fairly low ceiling. It's like seven feet. And um, but it was my kid's den. And I have my big record collection is there. There's a cork floor that was there so that they jump, they could jump off the couch and not break the head. You know, so the cork floor is there. There's a lot of wood. And then I put my awards, my my ego part of the room, you know, which happens to do a lot of nice reflection for the mid range. So it turned into this really great room, and I have the freedom of um, of being able to do so many things in the mix, which we'll get to. There's other questions regarding that, but I love it. You know, it was never a compromise to me when I went from strictly analog to hybrid, and I started learning hybrid, um, I didn't like it at all. And it, and Fernando can tell you the f frustration. I, I was like a five-year-old sometimes <laughs> because I just, I didn't know, I didn't know how to f express myself in this new format, but I knew it had to be done, you know, because it, I mean, friends of mine had told me, you got to do this, Nico Bolas, Tony Maserati, those guys that really helped me. So, it it all slowly came together, and when it did, at that moment, I was like, oh my goodness, this is not only as good, but actually even bigger, even more, more depth, more width, easier to get to that place. You know, it just takes time. It's like anything, you, you know, you're learning a new instrument. But the philosophy and the method, it doesn't change. And so it's just a learning a new toy, a new way to express yourself. If you don't know how to express yourself, it hardly matters, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I love my new room and, and I, it's in my house. I mean, I never thought it'd be the day that, you know, I, I mix, I go upstairs, I can have some lunch, you know, I can train on my bike, I can do whatever I want and go back and mix. It's, a, it's really ideal. Now, no, now I'm in the land of everybody else where you're, alone, you've got a tiny little studio, you know, the luxury of, of Electric Lady um, is long gone. And, and even my own studio after that, it's just not necessary for really any of us. We can, we're, you know, the, with, with the plugins that are out there now and the acoustical kind of uh, material you can get, and you've got, you've got, Teams viewer and you've got audio movers, right? Mm. I mean, Fernando has been in Fort Lee since beginning of COVID. He he hasn't been in the same room as me for you know two or three years, and there's no problem because we ha we're able to communicate constantly. He's looking at my screen. He can make changes. He can do whatever he wants. So yeah, I love where I am. Awesome. Okay. Um, well. 
along for things that are necessary. Carrie from Charlotte, North Carolina asks, is there a need for analog summon? That's up to you. Um, I'm not doing any analog summing. Um, well, summing, we're talking about the final stereo, right? I mean, that's, that's the impression. If you, do, if you do analog summing, then it's going to, if, if I think about recalls or if I think about doing stems, right, how does that complicate the issue? Well, you either have to recall it, um, print stems, or if you just set it and forget it, as long as nothing happens to the unit, you can just open the session and technically, technically should, should come yeah. back the same way every time. And you know the answer to that because you're asking something that's technical. When I know that, look, I, you know, I probably am in the nerd category, but I never think about it that way because it's all it's always about how do I make this an extension of my thinking and my thoughts. So for you, if you say analog summing uh, works for you because there isn't a plugin that simulates that same feel and that same energy, then go for it. I'm, I'm searching, I've been searching and I'm very happy with being able to use software instead of hardware um, at, at the last end of the stage. But to quickly add to that, I still have some analog gear that I love. And um, what I'll do there is if, um, it, let's see, there might be a, a EAR 660 that I love on a vocal. So I'll put it across the vocal because I've got a hardware plug-in, right? I've got some gear, I've got minimal. Although yesterday I pulled out three or four more pieces. I was like, oh, I really miss this piece of gear. And I was like, oh, I think I'll take this home, you know, and I'm calling Fernando. Hey, listen, I think I've got like five more things I want to patch in. <laughs> but, you know, it's now that I've been away from it for two or three years, it's kind of like, oh, this is going to be really cool. So, um what I'll do there is once I like that sound on the vocal, I print it immediately. I commit it, boom, done. Uh, if I use a MXR, a phaser flanger, anything that's a hardware, once I like it, also a lot of times I'm using my modified LA3As on the piano. Um, once I like that, what that piano is doing, immediately I print it. I'll take a picture of it and I'll send it to you know, email it to my guys, and then they have a record of the setting. But um, it's very temporary. Once I like it, print it, forget it, so that we don't have to worry about five songs down. Well, what what was the setting on it? Or we can't really print it because, you know, it's, it's still in the system. So everything is is taken care of in that respect. Awesome. Okay, next question is from Mike Ornsby in Toronto, Canada. And he says, what are your thoughts on immersive music as the possible future in music production, uh, not merely in remixing old recordings, but as a platform for new music, especially with the larger palette that immersive music technology provides? Well, I, I guess I'll let kind of Fernando jump in on this one too. I mean, right now I'm, I'm going back to old records that I've done, whether it was, um, well, time out of mind, I didn't, I didn't do the original, I did some of it. But some of the records, on, um, I'm doing a Coldplay record right now, one of the original ones that I mixed. And on, um, it's fun, but I have to remix, I have to remember how I originally mixed it. So it's way more work than you can imagine, because I have to remember wh what I did 25 years ago. Mm. And um, I, st I still have the notes, but still, I don't have all the gear and all the analog and everything. But, you know, I think immersive is fun. I don't, I, if you're implying, you know, should it be the source at like the way stereo is? Look, you know, what's going on in 2023? I can't imagine what it'll be like 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40, 50 years from now. So I'm going to say it'll probably be amazing at some point. I just don't see any real need for it right now, except that it's fun. You know, it's interactive at times. It's very immersive. Um, I like that. 
because when I was mixing in stereo, I was always trying to imagine that I had the sound around me. So all those years as I was developing my sound, you, you can hear the sound going from in front of me to slowly getting into the peripheral of my ears and my, my vision. So I've always kind of wanted that. So by doing immersive, it's really cool on headphones. As you all know, you know, the difference between mixing with speakers on the ceiling and the floor on the sides, I don't know who's gonna be listening to that system. There's like 0.0001% is gonna actually be listening to it. The rest of us, right, are listening to it on, on special headphones, you know, or ear pods or whatever. So ba basically you're looking at a stereo that feels just a little bit more immersive. You're not hearing something walking up and above behind you, unless you have some kind of binaural ears, mm -hmm. you know, IMAX kind of thing going on. Mm -hmm. So it, who knows, who knows what it'll be great. I, for me, I don't really, um, I'm still very big on stereo as the, the classic way to be listening, but immersive is fun. So, and, and it's still very, very early stage. 15, 10, well, who I say, you know, technology moves so fast. Mm -hmm. Five years from now, they'll come up with something and then suddenly Atmos mixing is insanely cool, right? But right now it's it's still it's in earliest stages. So we're working with what we have, but it feels right. I mean, you're very, very limited by by the the things. There's a lot of things that you would love, and I'm sure that they'll introduce within years, a couple of years, and then the more fun and easier it gets to be and the more the ability to actually have it feel like you've got speakers around you, why wouldn't they? You know, when, once that starts happening, yeah, that'll be even more fun and maybe forget stereo, forget stereo's too flat and boring and the immersive is gonna be great. Why not? I mean, look what happened in the last 20 years, 10 years, five years. So look, at, look down the road, it's gonna be crazy what you can do you know, hopefully I'm still around to be doing some of that because that, that's just right up my alley when I'm mixing. And I just always hear those things around my head, even when there's no music. Oh, it's so weird. But anyway, um, well, next question. Yeah, the next one, um, this one, I saw it go by online, but I'm just going to ask it since we're on the Atmos topic. Um, he was asking how the Brower as approach uh, affects when you're mixing in Atmos. What changes? Or are you using this when you're doing an Atmos mix? We're, mm, that's an interesting question because we're not really doing browserized no. Atmos because we're, again, the <clears throat> Atmos isn't sophisticated enough yet to be able to do what we're doing. Um, but so what I do is I'll mix first in stereo or Fernando's obviously mixes, you know, through the browserized method and once he's done, he'll do all the stems and then he spreads it around. There's no, the, the feeling and the emotion has already been established, mm. right? So now you're just taking that and you're spreading it around. Yeah, I, th I think also this kind of ties to the earlier question where because stereo is still king, Atmos is sort of like an afterthought, mm -hmm. even though you can do some really cool stuff and expand on the emotion you don't really start a mix right now from scratch in Atmos. I mean, maybe somebody does, but like, mm -hmm. it's not really that rule. So like, you're mixing in stereo, you're crafting, you're building in stereo, and then instead of trying to incorporate something as complex as this into Atmos, which it's not quite there yet, we print the stems, and then we have the big sounds that we've already done, mm -hmm. and then we can have fun just spraying it out in stereo, and to piggyback to the earlier question, I think because stereo is still the main thing, music production or producers are still thinking in stereo, mm -hmm. right? They're still crafting songs for stereo because Atmos is just like this deliverable thingy. Mm -hmm. But like fast forward five, 10 years, if Atmos gets much better and much more immersive in headphones and stuff, which I think it will, maybe it will shift and then maybe we will be mixing straight into Atmos 
and then maybe a breakdown of the stereo will just be a random delivery. Beautiful. And if we are consuming music in immersive from the get-go, and that's like the main, mm -hmm. then it opens possibilities for music production creation to create in immersive from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So then you're not trying to grab something that was done in stereo and make it more immersive. It's creative in immersive from the beginning, from the conception. Mm -hmm. And then that's just gonna like make it so much more like impactful. And then, then the pro I would assume at that point, um, you can then adapt Browrise to that new system. You know, you're gonna have, sure. you know, somebody's gonna come up with it, maybe it'll be me. Um, of how to now do brow rise, you know, instead of just A, B, C, D, we're looking at A, point one, point two, point three, <laughs> sure. B, point one, point two, point three, yeah. right? Because again, what's the point of this, this system? This system is just makes things more dynamic and more emotional, right? That's why I started to begin with. So why wouldn't you want to continue that? It's just, you have to learn technically how to adapt to a new format. Well, I've been doing that since analog, right? I did it, I've, you know, with the help of Fernando, you know, we went from uh, just strictly analog to a hybrid and then from hybrid to strictly in the, in the box. So it, it's, it's there to, you know, to be modifying and to mold into something new um, because it's about the the feel, about how you're gonna express yourself. And as the formats change, then you just evolve. It's a, it's a system that is open to being evolved and modified. Awesome. All right, uh, next question. This is from Stephen Kettner in Houston, Texas, and he says, do you keep A, B, C, D, E faders at zero, or do you automate them as well? And does most of your automation happen at the VCA level, or do you write your automation more at the fader levels? We keep A, B, C, D at zero. There's no writing happening on A, B, C, D. With the VCAs, the writing happens at the top level on the folders and those faders, mm -hmm. and with the VCA, it's really more like a global trim. Like if, if in a mix revision, they want all the drums to come down in the bridge, instead of doing it individually, I'll just go to a drum VCA and trim the whole thing down. Mm -hmm. But like the actual writing, it happens at the folder level. Right. Awesome. And probably some of you are gonna go, yeah, but if you bring down the VCA, there's less compression going on. That's true, but it's very slight. And generally, if anything, it's going to, make it feel even better as you bring the level down. <clears throat> not to say that you should always bring the level down to begin with, but, <coughs> but it's not an issue. It's, it's, not, it, it's not going to have a sonic uh, negative, <laughs> you know, to, yeah. you know it, it's, it's going to sound good, but globally it's the easiest thing to do and it's quick and we haven't found anything that that didn't work by just simply bringing down the uh, the global levels of the VCAs. And sometimes if it's a vocal, you know, you want more vocal, you just bring up globally, you can just bring the VCAs up a little bit on, um, yeah. Basically don't overthink it. If you've mixed it and it feels good and there's a mix revision and you gotta bring down a couple of dBs, don't go crazy thinking like, oh, what's gonna happen to a compression? Yeah. Just bring, just do a mix note, bring down two yeah. dBs. Bring it down. Right. I mean, right. it's again, do not overthink. This whole mm. process is about using your energy and, and your emotion. Do not think when you're mixing. And that continues all the way to the end where you're just feeling things. So you bring down the, the drums and you go, ah, it feels good. Okay, don't, don't overanalyze. Yeah, but, but this and but that, but what who cares mm -hmm. does it sound good yes okay you're done move on right right it's easy to um sort of mistake the the whole template that you've set up it's it's easy to get lost in the weeds of all of that because it seems like something that's very heady and very you know based around all of that but at the root of it it's still following you know what you're wanting to hear come out of the speakers and and not getting lost in all of that stuff yeah, it's, it's a tool to help you express yourself. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it's it's a tool that is literally like under the hood right you're not driving with you're not driving underneath the hood you're not driving the engine you're driving the car yeah yeah it's like a counterintuitive thing to say like don't think about it too much when there's so much going on in the routing and all of that but the point is don't yeah well set up right learn learn the new tool until you don't have to think about it it's no different than learning any instrument you know you're learning the instrument you're figuring it out you can't quite express yourself because you don't know how to execute your ideas but once you learn that then you don't have to think about it anymore and you just perform that's what this tool does it allows you to perform to your utmost creativity <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so next question is from Simon and Seal, and he says, uh, do you ever choose to send bass DI or bass amp tracks to the low or high bass buses separately? If so, why? Or do you always get a blend you like and just send that to both? I mean, I can answer that, but Fernando says it better than me. Um, or not. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch uh, We just do a blend. Um, yeah. you, mo most of the time, we just get a bass track maybe the producer have already like made a blend on the recording that he likes we love to keep that if we do get like a d like a di and, a, and an amp or something i'll usually just comp them together uh one sound mm -hmm. and it, that one sound will get split into um the the high and the low bass mm -hmm. okay. and you know and when he when he says cop i mean it might just stay in the folder right and it'll be direct and and if i want it more amp and less direct i can easily do that because it's right there in, in the folder but i don't want to separate that too much i don't want an isolation i want to blend that bass the bass and the kick need to be one sound now is there going to be an exception yes and when that exception happens go for it do what you want to do to make it sound right for the song mm -hmm. but the starting point is generally just to keep the blend together Okay, next question's from Greg Kosick in Calgary, uh, Canada. And he says, hi, Michael, would you be able to describe or share a simplified or stripped down version of a template using only the most essential browserizing? Thanks in advance. So Fernando and I thought about this. And I think the absolute basic, let's start with ABCD. Yep. Now, ABCD, you know, you see a lot of slate stuff going on first. And that's because now that I'm in the box, I found the joy. I know what an SSL sounds like, a Neve sounds like, a Trident sounds like, a Helio sounds like. And I was like, wow, I can do that. Right? And that's what I did. So um, you can eliminate all of that. You still have to have your basic EQ and compressor on A and then your compressor on B and, and, and oh, Compressor on EQ on B. on B, and then your compressor on C, and then your stuff on D. But um, if you just want to eliminate all that, you can, and maybe just put an SSL strip on there. So it still sounds like the console, right? Yep. You can remove all of that. With all the, the sends, I mean, I, I have different reverbs. Don't you want to have options to, to use short reverbs, long reverbs? I mean, that's what you do anyway, right? in whatever setup you have. So pick pick the three reverbs you love the most. The, the 1176 is a must. That is a very important part. So you must have the two 1176s that are on the, on the panner, you know, left and right panner. Yep. Uh, that's that. Um, that's, I mean, that's the basic. Now for vocal return. Well, the vocal return again you're making a vocal you're compiling a vocal sound so if you can do it in three or four do it um but they're all they're all digital plugins i mean what's another two or three um but again i think that would be uh, as simple as we can get and then as far as a stereo bus um again i I love I love my germaniums. I mean that's been part of my sound for many years on so and I'm mixing into that right so I'm hearing it that way right from the get-go. It's not like I pop it in later. Um, and I'm emulating my 
my SSL console. So the first thing that is in the chain is the SSL compressor. And the new one is really, really good, right? The, the actual SSL compressor. Yeah, it's the new version done by SSL. By SSL yeah. is really good. The only thing it doesn't have in there is a, is it a wet dry? I think it does have a wet dry. But and does it have a, a side chain link? Uh, yes. Okay. So there's something that the plug-in alliance, that's the one I usually use, right? Uh, UAD. Oh, UAD. The, yeah. They're really, really close. And sometimes I just go between the two and I go, oh, SSL sounds better on this song. Oh, UAD. That's been my default. That sounds better. Try it. You know, but I, but it says still it's got an SSL thing going on it, followed by the germaniums. And then leave it at that, you know, or try it without the germaniums. I mean, that's mm -hmm. up to you and your style and what, what kind of music are you doing, right? Maybe the germaniums isn't quite appropriate. Um, that answers it, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, next one. And I have a question about the germaniums. Uh, this is from Mikkel in Copenhagen. And um, I kind of want to read this one with like the angry commenter voice. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Go for it. All right. Hey, Michael. I played around with your template. I've mixed in and the you box. You suck. <laughs> <laughs> I've mixed in the box for years, and I've always routed the audio tracks to auxes and inserted some kind of SSL channel strip, so I got the console feeling. Now I use routing folders like your template. Therefore, it was kind of easy for me to incorporate your thing so I could try it out. <laughs> Uh, I'm having a little bit of trouble figuring out how your use of the Chandler germanium on stereo bus works. Uh, I think it compresses a bit much. I use your mid-bottom oh, settings. The SSL before is barely moving, uh, but when I'm around minus nine, the Chandler is usually compressing around 10 dB, uh, even with the dry net wet knob set around zero. I think it chokes the transient a bit too much. I've tweaked it. Um, there's, there's a little bit more, but basically you feel yeah, that yeah. it's too, too much. So we're both going to jump in on this one. I, what I've discovered over the years, the sweet spot for the germaniums with a setup that I have, right, with the, I think it's at 2 o'clock or something. 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock with the wet-dry, right, blend. At tw when that meter is looking at 12 o'clock straight up, that feels great. That just feels great, you know, a lot... You go up to the right, it starts doing more, doesn't sound so good. To the left, doesn't sound as good. Right up the middle with the settings that I have. Now, I have three different um, settings for the germaniums. There's the regular bottom, which has way too much bottom. <laughs> um, and then the mid bottom, which matches much closer what I had in the analog world. And then less bottom where, and again, it's a matter of playing with the feed and the, the feedback and the output and the feedback and the output. And sometimes so if you got like a heavy bottom, the less bottom uh, setting works even, you know, works better. It just makes it, it just feels right. Um, but when you're saying that it, there's over compression, he and I were thinking about that. And it was like, we don't, we don't notice that. Um, so what's going on? And you're saying there's hardly anything going on in the SSL. We usually have the SSLs working around yep. two or three dB. So it's taming it down a little bit before it gets the germanium. Yep. Um, and there's no sound of like, oh, it's overcompressed. So maybe what's going on is that you haven't been playing with Submaster 8, right? That's the one that where you want to see how everything is is hitting A, B, C, D. Because maybe what you're thinking is the germanium is the one that is at fault, when really it's the combination of, of A, B, C, D that is just pushing a little too hard. And it's it's doing this and it's not playing, it's not giving, right? The whole thing about A, B, C, D, it's a playful thing. When you're mixing it, it goes in and it comes out and you know, we've spent a lot of time on the video portion to just to explain how that feel should be. So maybe, I mean, there isn't a time when I don't go to eight at some point in the mix, drop it down a little bit to the point where it's 
it goes flat on me and then maybe go up a little higher. And I just kind of zone in and zone in. I go, oh, this feels great. And then I look over and see, is that where I started or is that where I am now? And because again, every stage that you're mixing into compression, right? Every stage. So, so right from the beginning of how you're feeding the folders to how you're, you're riding everything in A, B, C, D, which then goes into the stereo bus, um, all has a bit of an effect. And yes, it's going to take a little time. But once, once you hear that, you, you hear it, you feel it immediately. And so you know exactly where to go. Yeah? And it's going to take time. You have to have patience. It's not like it's the traditional approach. And like anything else, you just got to give it time and learn. What would you say about that as far as the yeah, overcompression? Just to clarify a couple of points. Um, um, when he's saying VCA 8, just know that it's the VCA master. It's basically the one fader that we have assigned mm. that controls all the, the folders at the top. So when he's moving that VCA master, all the volumes of the tracks up top are shifting together. And those are before the ABCD. So with that one fader, he can really go in detail and find like right the sweet spot of ABCD, right? Um, another thing, when he's saying the meter on the germaniums, the sweet spot is around 12 o'clock, mm -hmm. that is 10, mm -hmm. which is where the question is, is, is going. That is where we find sounds the best. So if you have our settings, if you have the wet and dry, mm. so it's not choking up, being at 10, at least we don't find or we don't agree that it's choking any transients or anything. So that's what lets us to say, if that's where you're thinking, maybe the root of the problem is at an Further earlier down the level. Chain. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it, it might be all the way down to what's feeding the folders. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if you have everything fed correctly and everything's happy and you still feel like it's a germanium, then I, it's, it's just subjective. You're entitled to your opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for that question. Uh, next one is from uh, Jesse Gay in Portland. And he asks, how, if at all, would the Browerizing, <clears throat> browerizing workflow be adjusted for electronic music? Can you point to specific tracks or mixers who incorporate these techniques in these genres? Thanks. Well, the, the whole method was designed to work with any approach. So um, it, it, it's not just electronic music. It's anything and everything. Um, and so, you know, you want an example or technically, well, what does that, you know, what would you change for electronic music? Ah, you got to play with it. I mean, generally... Um, I mean, maybe it's, it's changing what's going on across B. You know, I have usually the distressor um, and then the EQs and a couple other things. And, but Fernando came up when he was doing more kind of urban-y stuff, he came up with a different patch, which I think that's included, isn't it, in the template? Mm -hmm. your, your approach and my mm -hmm. approach? And yep. so there might be even a third approach where if you use a different type of compressor and a different type of EQ with a different curve, it'll work perfectly for, for electronic music. You, you experiment. That's why, that's why it's there. That's why it's not in one box where you only have choice of one button. You can, you can dig in or leave it alone. So play with it. C, start off with B, right? Because B has got the drums and the bass and the percussion. So in that respect, I think that's going to have the biggest impact on your bottom end. And if you find something that's absolutely killer, then you will write us and you will send us mm -hmm. the settings. <laughs> and then, you know, and Fernando will go, thank you. You know, I mean, look at all I'm giving you. Give me some of your stuff, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, I, I've done it. Uh, it works great because at the end of the day, the tool is is to create that emotion and that movement, and that works on, on any type of music. So if you just experiment with changing some of the uh, of the plugins, like Michael was saying, uh, maybe uh, trying like a Shadow Heels on B, or or maybe instead of the pool take on A, you go with a, a more modern EQ, maybe like a, like a Mac EQ with that top end, or 
you add some like ozone imager to open those synths. Um, it works really great. Uh, it, it's not genre genre dependent. And that would be across A. Yeah, because that's where you have the synths. Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, remember what's going on. If it's all about the synths, then play with A, right? See what you can add maybe. Instead of replacing, maybe what you can add. Just like Fernando said, maybe add an imager. If it's guitars, if it's, you know, if there's some kind of, it's in the guitar range kind of stuff going on, um, and you want something different, play with C. And, you know, and I mean, that's why they're there, right? I'm giving you a starting point. What I've got works on many styles. But music is changing all the time. You know, I've changed, the ABCD has gone through different generations, right? I mean, somebody was asking me uh, or mentioning the, uh, the Joe Meek, mm -hmm. right? Joe Meek was my guitar sound for years. That, that has a shimmering, and you would never want to look at the meter because the meter was like practically slammed. And that it was only when it got to a certain point, maybe an inch from, from all the way to the left, that the music would, the guitars would just do this shimmering thing. And, and I can answer that. The question was, do you ever use that in mono or, or um, multi-stereo? I don't ever remember the Joe Meek 1.05 having an option. It had one meter in the middle, and it controlled both sides. I don't remember a button in the back that said, um, well, I don't remember. If there is one, it would be multi-mono. Mm -hmm. Let me put it that way. But I don't remember that it actually had that option. So that now answered yeah. that question really cool. fast. And sorry, I, I didn't get the username of the person that asked that, but that was a question uh, for the Joe Meek SC2 user. Okay, so our next question is from Roberto uh, in France. And he says, hi, Michael and Fernando, how are you doing? I'd love to know about Fernando, since he is a meticulous, wonderful dude. You have a fan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when he was making the available plug-in emulations match the hardware, did, uh, I'll talk about you like you're in the room, did you do it all, the, all by you. ear and a buttload of patience, or did, he ever, or did you ever enter the world of plug-in doctor and graphs um, while looking at those? And he says, I know Michael's rolling his eyes right now. Stop it, Brower. Uh, merci. <laughs> so. um, I, I know with being next to Michael, I, I am r rolled more into like a very technical role mm -hmm. because he's not too technical. But compared to other people who are very technical, I'm not too technical either. Yeah. So... <laughs> I don't know what the hell is Plugin Doctor. Uh, I I couldn't open the um, diagrams or the electronics for the gear because I wouldn't understand them, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm not a tech. I don't know how to fix gear or anything like that. So the thing that I relied on when I was doing that were just my ears because, yeah. I mean, I know I have good ears and they're trained and developed, so I trust them. Um, the most... The most uh, Technique thing that I did would be like if I was trying to emulate a piece of gear uh, that I know it's used on the vocal, maybe I would like put a vocal through that and like uh, see like an analyzer mm -hmm. to see like how that piece of gear was affecting certain frequencies. Mm -hmm. And then I would put it through the emulation that I was working and then compare those graphs mm -hmm. um, to see like where maybe I was lacking or I was too high. That's like the most, you know. Um, technical thing that I did, and, and, and it did help. It, mm -hmm. it definitely did help, but 85% uh, of the work was done literally just by ears, uh, a buttload of patience, like you put it, hundreds of tries, uh, not hundreds, but a lot of tries, and just comparing, mm -hmm. comparing, comparing, tweaking, 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 until it, it felt good. And, and then every time he would be at a point where he's like happy, then he would bring it in Right, I'd, I'd say, okay, listen to this. And so I'd put up a track and I'd listen. And um, if I had comments, I would say, okay, you know, I like this, but tweak that, 
this I'm not feeling. So the fact that, let's say he had been a total tech nerd and had it on graphs and stuff, it means nothing to me because I could just as easily go, yeah, I don't, it doesn't feel right. And he goes, yeah, but it looks right. You know, Mm. I mean, that would, Fernando would never say that. But he has a happy balance between technical and musical because he knows how it should feel. And that's from years of, you know, of my mentoring him and, and him listening every day to what I'm doing. Um, so I think that um, for the most part, could it have been the, doc, the sound doctor or something? Could it have sped any of the process up? It might have given you a bit of a quicker starting point but we were already we already knew what we were looking for and what we wanted to hear right so um this is a process that worked for us and it worked really really well because you know going back and forth trying the ideas and saying okay i don't like this i like this why am i saying i don't like this it's like because it doesn't quite feel right to me yet it doesn't feel right it doesn't that's always was everything was based on well how does it remind me of what i was doing in the hardware world no go back and keep going you know and then hopefully maybe you know four or five months later a new plugin would would come out that's an emulation of you know another variation of a particular hardware that I was using and he would try that and he'd come in and go here try listen to this I'm like oh I love that what did you do whatever you did we're good okay now maybe let's just tweak that right then we're like super happy because again all I want to do is just continue whether it's in a laptop or it's on a desk or it's in a hybrid I just want to keep feeling that certain energy and that certain playfulness um that I was getting in the analog world, which I have to say, um, from what we've been doing in the digital world, is actually more dynamic, warmer, deeper, wider. It's crazy. I, I trust me. I was all I was hoping for was at least the same. There was no way I was going to be ten percent less than what I was loving. So I was all I was aiming for was it has to be feeling as good. It didn't take long before I'm going, wow, it feels even better. So that was the bonus. I was not expecting that. I was maybe wishing it, but not expecting it. Yeah, basically I approached I approached a very technical process from a musical standpoint mm-hmm. instead of approaching a technical thing from a technical standpoint and trying to conform it into musicality later. Exactly, because yeah. that's not going to work. You know, and some of the questions that we've been reading, you're a little too hung up on the technical side and not using enough of your musical part of your head. Mm-hmm. So, um, but we'll address those. So cool. I think that that answered that question. Awesome. Um, you had a, a positive comment in the live chat there. They said, Fernando, you hit it on the head. We as engineers have to listen and stop looking at our music. Who cares what it looks like? Music has to sound good. Hundred percent. Who'd have 100%. thought? <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah, you're you're sending the artist back the mix as a as a wave file. They're not seeing what the hell you did in your session. They don't care. Yeah. Is, does it sound good or not? Right. Does yeah. it feel good or not? Yeah. And feel and <coughs> and sound, of course. Awesome. Okay. Um, there was a question in the live chat. If we're taking only questions from the Pure Mix Pro members or uh, from the live chat as well, right now we're doing the pre-submitted questions that happen from the Pro Mix members or Pro members on Pure Mix. And then we're going to be transitioning into live Q and A. Right. And questions. we're going to try to go through this as fast as possible yeah. because there's so many questions. All right, next all one. Right. Uh, we're on twelve. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep going. Okay. All right. This one's from Ivan uh, in Santiago. He says, "How can you get instrument signal levels at minus eighteen dBFS to work with analog gear and plug-in emulations? Have your faders around Unity and have the right instrument balances." Okay. Um, Saludos a Chile. Mm. Uh, I think you maybe misunderstood because the minus 18 thing, that's just like for the calibration of like the ABCD. You're you're not trying to mix with your instruments at at minus 18, Mm. right? So the minus 18 thing is just so that you have your buses calibrated the right way. But then 
just mix into them and it's all about the feel. It's about mm. hitting them in the sweet spot uh, the, uh, so they're not like either over compressing and squashing it or under compressing and not doing enough. It's about that, you know, that push and that and that pushback. Mm -hmm. So don't try to go with like numbers or where to put your, your faders, just, just, just mix. Yeah. Just mix. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Unless you want to add something more. Well, just, um, you know, if somebody had the faders at zero on it, I mean, it's, it's literally just bring them up until it feels good. That's, that's right. That's the point. Yeah. That's it. Right. Zero being down. Yeah, yeah. Right. All Minus infinity. Yeah, yeah, right. not yeah, yeah. infinity down. Yeah, yeah all yeah. the way down. Well, earlier when yeah. I was talking about it's nice when a fader is at zero, it's like the number zero. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, there's like minus 10, minus 5, zero, plus 6, at least on, on this one. It's not like zero is like three quarters of the way up. It's not like mm -hmm. zero VU or anything. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next question is from Liam Hickey in Liverpool. And he says, I found gain staging to, or I found gain staging to zero on VU best for my vocals. Do you gain stage into each compressor when browserizing? Uh, kind of in the same vein well, of the last question. Well, yes, the the calibration for the buses is set. We have the video, so yes, we do calibrate them when we browserize. Uh, in regards of the vocal, <coughs> actually, we have a the template up here. I'm just gonna show it for a sec because this question made us think that yeah, we explained what we did with the vocal very extensively on the video. We just didn't quite show the calibration. Mm -hmm. Um, well, we said the calibration should be at, at sh it should be a plus one calibration, and then you should make sure that the return, no matter what comes back, should all be at the same level. But this needs to be done with a vocal. It doesn't work with a with a tone, especially if you if you put it at one k, forget about it. It's not going to work. I mean, the closest thing. When Fernando was trying to do that, we said, I said, I don't remember us doing tone. He goes, well, in 1K, it's like all your all your compressors are like way off. They're all jamming. I'm like, that's not possible. I would have heard that. <laughs> I mean, and he goes, and I, I said, well, let's just do the vocal. And as soon as we put the vocal up, all the calibrations we had done was perfect. It was right around 1 dB because... Because a vocal isn't at 1K. A vocal is a full dynamic voice, a big round sound of low end, mid range, and you know, fair about you know, upper mid range and stuff. The com combination of that is what's triggering the compressor. So to try to just use one in the in respect to making the vocal sound, um, you need to use a vocal. The, what I did have Fernando try is, okay, 1K definitely would not work. Try 100 hertz, you know, and so he tried 100 hertz and it was a little bit more in the ballpark. But what I'm telling you is don't use frequency. Use a vocal. Yep. It's a vocal return compressor. Use a vocal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then look at all the compressors. Now, some of them aren't supposed to do 1 dB, right? Because the nuke... The nuke on the on the distressor is supposed to go crazy. The um, eleven seventy six with the ratios in is supposed to go crazy, yep. and the um, the valve one, the I mean that one is no the the rest are kind of like in line. Okay, yeah, yeah. the line. But there's a couple that are strictly for the feeling of urgency or the feeling of saturation. Um, so there's no. That's not going to sound right if you do it plus one dB. It's a whole other animal. It's not even acting right, right? That's yeah. that's its purpose. Um, and then they all have to return so that, so that the vocal sounds the same level when you go through all of them. Now, having said that, and Fernando reminded me, I said, you don't put all those faders up and then you mix with mm -hmm. that blend together. I'm saying when you're calibrating, you want to be able to go between one fader and the you know one sound and the other and not have one too low and one too loud because you might go oh that one sounds better because it's louder once you, the initial calibration then you leave it alone then you put them all down and then you build according to the which one sounds the best to begin with and then the other ones are usually you know 
depending if you want to use all of them, are usually five to six dB lower. You know, I for a long time I was starting with the with a T, T TLA. TLA. That was I love that sound. And then I would build the chest and the head and the throaty and you know the urgency if I needed it around that one. But they didn't all go at zero because then you obliterate the main sounding one. So they'd all be like maybe five or ten dB lower, maybe even less. Because all I do is I'm bringing up the other ones to see how it can complement the main one, right? Mm. And then I started listening to, I think I put in the Presto that, that Devin, uh, what's his company's? Uh, Powers? Yeah. Ka Kasarov? Kasarov. Um, he, he emulated the Presto that he and I, I think we were the only two in the country that had those, and we loved them. And so he, he sampled that one, modeled it, and I started using the Presto first, <clears> and I just fell in love with the Presto, and so now the other ones are subordinate to it. Mm -hmm. um, they complement the Presto. It's what you're doing. It's whatever kind of record you're making. That's why you want to try all of the other ones, right? Yeah. That so answers that. Yeah. yeah. So to summarize it, the the A B C D has a very specific tone calibration process in the low end, the mid range, the high end, and then you set it and forget it. When you're calibrating the the vocal compressors, put in a vocal, any vocal you like. Um, just to make it easy, just grab like one phrase of the vocal that you loop. Mm. So it's the same, uh, the, the same impact impact mm -hmm. on, on all the compressors. Set up your compressors, send that vocal, put your fader like where you would normally mix a vocal, right? Like don't put it too low, too high, like mm -hmm. usually where, where you would sit it. And then you tweak your, your compression so that each compressor is doing like 1 dB. Um, if you're if you're doing like something like we do with like the blue stripe and the stressor, those are like you know more you know wacky because they're doing a specific thing, and then you have all your faders at zero. Uh, you, you match the gain in the plugin if you need to, and then uh, you mute all of them, and then that's what he was saying. When you compare one to the other, you're mm -hmm. you're hearing the returns be the same, so you can decide which one you like better, or maybe you want to try a different plugin. Once you've built your different compressors, then faders down. And when you're mixing, you build your vocal tone based mm. on which compressors uh, work better for that genre. And yeah. you're going to find, as I have, that on the next song, you start with that default. You make that default, right? And you can you can write different defaults. It could be like a pop default, um, urban default, rap default. Who knows? But... You know, I find that that when I've got one that I really like, and maybe it's just because I'm going through something different, I'm like, you know, this is, I just love this new sound, right? And that's what's so great about it. It's like, you just come up with these great, cool combinations. And then the next song, that same default I request. So I go, okay, you know, Alex, and this is my new default. Okay, okay. And so the next time I, I mix a song, that's going to be my my new setup. Like now, lately, it's been the Presto as the top dog, and then the other ones are support. And sometimes I go, I don't need those other ones. I'll just turn them off. They, it's it's they're there to complement the the emotion, the sometimes the sensitivity, or other times the anger, or other times the urgency, or other times the aggression of a vocal. That sometimes isn't quite there when it was recorded, but it, you know, they were singing it, but it just didn't come across. So you start adding some of the throat and some of the urgency to it. And you get this big, fat, beautiful vocal that is just very powerful, but it's not banging the meter. Yeah. All right. Next awesome. question. So, yeah, if, if you guys want to see an example of Michael doing that, uh, there was a question in the in the chat, too, about what video we're talking about. So Michael has a video explaining this entire template that's on Pure Mix. Um, you can head over to puremix.com and see the video. You go through and you mix a song at the end of it. And this one in particular that. is episode five. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Episode yeah. five is, talks all about the vocal. Mm -hmm. And and I, you know, we looked at it today and was like, oh, you know what? We didn't say it should, the calibration should be done with the vocals. So mm -hmm. at some point, you will see a little subtitle goes, use vocal for calibration. <laughs> Probably in that voice. Yeah, definitely in that voice. Yeah, definitely yeah. in that voice. All right, Sorry. next. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to go past the gain staging thing. Um, 
Okay. So this one's from Harry in Vienna, and he says, what are your personal biggest struggles in the current music industry? Well, that's a good question, but I can tell you that that's been an ongoing uh, challenge for me since the beginning. I've always been, <laughs> I've always felt like I've been struggling because I've never stayed in the safe zone for very long, right? If I s succeed at something and I, I really am doing well, and then I have the luxury, of course, to, to show it off by mixing a record that really um, brings out whatever style I was working at, right? Because I usually spend five to six years on a particular style of music. And then I'm like, okay, this is great. And now I'm like a bit too comfortable in this, you know? And I'm already being pigeonholed as now the R&B mixer, right? Because I was starting with Luther and Aretha and, and James Brown. And I'm like, okay, well, it's time to move on now. Mm. And so I would say, well, what do I want to do next? And then I would spend a, you know, I would spend a good six, eight months thinking about what would I like to do next? And then when I would decide, it usually happened over Christmas. I'd say, okay, now I'm going to start moving towards a new style of music. And then I would slowly start changing my go-tos. You know, it's always going to have to be a go-to. The, the changes are going to be the drums, the vocal sound, the bass. Those are the usually something, you know, what's down in the root and what's down at the top. You're going to have to change that. And I was, you know, at the time, I, I don't know where I was. I, was, I wanted to go t more towards R&B rock right, which eventually moved towards my doing the stones. So I would just start changing. And then whenever it was appropriate, I if I was mixing a record or a song that allowed me to not use my go to's, you know, I, I'd be really scared. I mean, like, oh, it's so easy just to do this. And I go, yeah, but that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. That's not going to get you the phone call. You need to really just think differently. And of course, I'm always, you know, I got two, three, four people talking to me when I'm mixing, you know, try this, try that. Don't be scared. You know, I am scared, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And so then I would start doing that and I'd have to prove myself all over again. Right. Labels would go, well, you know, you're you're an R&B. Well, no, actually, I, I'm a record mixer, mm -hmm. motherfucker. Mm -hmm. You know, I can do other things, but I would spend a long time and eventually I would get that break of that kind of record and I would do more of those and then I'd be getting to be known and my my changing of approach um, would work for that different style of music and then you know I'd get to that pinnacle where I go oh, this is great I'm getting really comfortable again I'm going to enjoy that for maybe another four or five months and then I'm going to get scared again like where do I want to go next mm -hmm. Because I'm a record mixer. I want to be able to mix all styles. You know, that's my joy. And then and I start thinking. And then like I remember the one when it was indie music, you know, and I was like, God, I really, really want to do Grizzly Bear. I really mm. want to do Twin Shadows. They would never call me, you know, with the records that they're hearing that I'm doing. They would never call me, right? I was like, well, what do I have to do? You know, and, and I start thinking, you know, am I listening to other music? Yeah, I, pro I would be listening to what they had done. And I start analyzing, well, how do I adapt what I do to that? What, what is the problem right now with what I'm doing that would not, that would be objective to, um, to maybe an indie record? Okay, well, the sound of the drums, that's got to change. The vocal definitely has got to change. Where in the song? Yeah, the guitars. There has to be more. It's a different image. Okay. So I slowly would start thinking about that. But in time, it wasn't like, okay, I got myself a week. I got to change my whole life around. <laughs> I would just like slowly, months and months first, or am I thinking about what am I going to do next? And then I got to do, and then, you know, then I got to, hope that these guys would be interested. I mean, I had a good manager. I've always had a good manager who could help me at least make the introduction. And then sometimes what do you do? You mix something for free for somebody. And if you want to move on, it's like, who cares? It's, it's you know, you have to commit 
and try and and con, you know and people want to hear what you're doing just because I'm good at this if they don't like that kind of style of music well what if I show you what I can do and it's on me here let me do one song you like it fine then we make a deal um, that's how you start you know when you're trying to break into a new approach so and then I'd have to you know and then I have to prove it all over again to the labels right so for me it's always been a struggle mm. but more more recently now going completely in the box um has been just exhilarating i mean it, it there's just so many more things i can do now but moving towards atmos uh just discovering new approaches um you know maybe not as well sonically yes but but jumping into more of what this world is about and again it's it's a you know it's a struggle but then and also you know once you get that that title of legend it's it, it could be a kiss of death because they're like oh he's a legend he's an old guy you know i was like who wants i mean it, it, there's always something to battle and to struggle but I, I i don't care i still love what i do i love to mix a good song so i'm always searching for a great song and you know it can be with an unsigned band it can be with a label um but for me I always feel like I'm struggling, which I think is a good thing because I always feel vulnerable. I always feel a bit nervous. Um, I've always feels like I could just got to nail it. I mean, I've always felt I got to nail it. When I wake up in the morning, I'm going to blow minds. That's what I do every day. That's in my mind. It's not in my, oh, I don't feel so good. Maybe I'll just do an average mix. Nobody will, nobody will call, you know, notice. I mean, look at all my gold records and my silver, oh, and my Grammys. Nobody's going to notice. That's bullshit. You don't mix it well, it sucks. And you're not doing a, you know, you're doing a major disservice to the artist. So every day has to be great. So for me, I'm always struggling. <laughs> you know, that's the long and short of it. Uh, nothing changes. <laughs> the great answer. Awesome. All right. Um, there's a uh, computer setup question, and I was thinking it'd actually be pretty fun to talk about your travel rig that you brought today, okay. too, with us. Uh, so uh, this is from Ben in Germany, and he says, the walkthrough of your Pro Tools template is extremely detailed, but you must need a lot of processing power to run it. What is the hardware that you use to smoothly run your fully in-the-box setup? So we have a, a Mac Pro trash can. Um, maxed out we've had it for a few years now we're definitely gonna be transitioning i would say in like the near mid near future to one of the newer uh, m1 m2 um, you know just waiting for pro tools to be rolled out uh, i know they're in beta right now and and all the plugins we like to be to be mm -hmm. native and then we'll probably do that but right now we're, we're running our trusty trash can <laughs> we have three Pro Tools HDX cards. Mm -hmm. We have three UAD Octo cards, so we're running 24 chips. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, the Orion converter, um, the faders, but in terms of computer processing power, that that's it. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, and then you mentioned this travel rig. Yeah. Um, this was great. It was a point where when when I when I moved out of the city and basically just moved up to the country in my house, I was like, oh, this is cool. But then I so saw I'm thinking, well, now I don't have this huge albatross around my neck. I don't have six mm. double-sided, you know, power eating analog. I can do it all in the box. And I'm thinking, you know what I'd love to do? I'd love to do what Tony does. I mean, Tony would tell me, he goes, yeah, you know, I'm on the plane, I'm mixing a song, you know, and then I go there and then, I don't know if he was working with Beyonce or one of the great artists, you know, and, and I get off the plane, I go to their house, we tweak it, and then I get back on the plane and then I go back to the studio and I'll open it up into some of the analog stuff, but it's all there and I can travel. And I remember him saying that, like, I don't know, five, six years ago, I was, I was just like, oh, that's not possible. <laughs> you know, you can do that, you know? And then, so 
when I moved up to the country, I'm thinking, okay. The other thing that I started doing is I used to have a racing team many years ago, and then I started training again and full time because I'm I'm up in the country now and up, up in the mountains. And so I thought, okay, um, if I'm going to be training, if I want to travel, if I'm going to be training in Colorado or you know Tucson or somewhere, and I want to be doing a two week block and I've got stuff to mix. I should be able to mix anywhere I want in the world. And I thought, how cool would that be? I could be just like Tony, you know, <laughs> and all the other guys, you know, I, literally all the other guys, but Tony's the one that I always refer to. And so I said, Fernando one day, hey, I want a travel gig rig, man. I, I want to be able to, and I got to have some faders. I got to have my faders. I'll, t I'll take one bucket. If you can fit in two buckets, it'd be great, but I need at least one bucket, fully loaded Mac, uh, keyboard, and then of course I won't have speakers, so I needed some great headphones, which at the time we we hadn't really found, but now we do. It's the Audesi um, MM500. Oh, Manny, Manny nailed this. I mean, really, literally, the first time I can put those headphones on, mix my record, and and it's like, wow, it sounds great. It sounds great. I mean, everybody's ears are a little bit different, so headphones, different headphones for different folks. But I love those. Fernando has them. He loves them. I got a pair for my son. He loves them. Um, so we're all, you know, big, big fans of that. And so now I can go anywhere. I'm not going to be disturbing anybody. And I can mix. I can train during the day. I can mix in the evening or train in the evening, mix in the day on and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy because I've got the best of both worlds. So that ha that's how that started. And it's in one of those, what's those cases Pelican, called? Pelican case. A Pelican case. <laughs> um, it ships really easily. It's under 50 pounds. Um, and I have my two UAD satellites and I got my dock. Of course, I have to always remember to bring my eye lock from my main rig. Um, and then I've got the Lion uh, monitor, right? Uh, it's Black Lion Revolution 2x2. Thank you. Interface. Right. And I'm set. <laughs> it's like, that's what I love about technology. I mean, I, the idea that I'm free to just go anywhere, that's just the best feeling in the world. I just can't. Exp and the fact that I learn how to mix all in the box now. So, I mean, I, I feel good. I feel... I feel better in the box than I would back on an analog desk, um, I think just because of some of the limitations. And they're great, the, again, maybe putting, going back on my SSL at, at Electric Lady, I would, I would get a sound that I would go, oh my God, that's such a great sound. But the records I'm making, they sound really, really good. So I don't feel compromised at all. Um, it's a new world for me you know, by moving into this, but it gives me the freedom. And yeah, and I couldn't be happy. And then I can go anywhere in the world and I can still have access to Alexon, you know, or Fernando. They can still jump in on TeamViewer if I need their help because, you know, something goes wrong. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I mean, it's just, I don't know what's going on in the engine. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have to call them. That's just the way it is. I mean, I slowly am learning and getting better, but I don't know. I'm no rocket scientist for that. Next question. Awesome. Okay, next one is from Alexis uh, Charrier, and they ask, except for the multibus, do you have? Do you also compress on each track individually? Uh, and then separately, about reverb and effects, do you use separate reverbs for each family of instruments, or do they all get the same auxes? Because I think it messes with the separation that the multibus concept creates, question mark? Um, all right, first of all, yeah, I, I'll, I'll put plugins across the tracks. I mean, I'm getting a sound. It's not like as if everything has to be um, untouched until it gets to the A, B, C, D. There's no rules here. This is, it's a starting point, you know, and, and I have certain plugins that I love. There's certain EQs that I'm ready to go with, you know. I mean, I start off with SSL um, 9000 across every channel. But 
there are times where I've got my hits filled that I'd like, you know, on my kick and my snare. Um, I've got certain things already as a starting point on my bass. I've got certain por starting points on my vocal before it gets to, um, you know, the next stage of, of the returns. And then, um, okay, and then as far as reverbs, what was the question on the reverbs? It was, um, do you remember what it was? Yeah. It, it, he'll answer it. Okay. Um, no, we don't separate the reverbs by instrument family. We just have, you know, the six, seven reverbs that, that Michael likes and he can access them from anything. The, the guitar might be using the same uh, reverb as the vocal, as the snare. Just... It's a glue factor. And, then, and when you say, yeah, but that seems to go against what you first created, no. It, it, it isn't. There isn't that kind of separation. They all work together. Mm -hmm. There's independence between each other, but that doesn't mean that there isn't cross-pollination going on in between. It's music. They're all playing together. They're all, they're all playing in the same room. I just, if you imagine, okay, me and the drummer, I, I mean, the drummer and the bass player, I was the drummer. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. We're playing, okay, we got a nice groove going. Uh, and the guitar starts playing really loud and the vocal starts screaming loud, it's not going to affect the groove we have. But we're still playing together. So the vocal can scream all they want and it's not going to affect the processing that has me and the bass player getting a nice groove. Do you ever get that thing where you, you start off with the, with the drums and bass and, and it feels really, really good? You've got, you've got your compressor across all of that and then... You start adding another thing, and then the compressor starts to work a little too hard, and then you add more, and then eventually that cool sound you had going in the drums and bass kind of disappeared. Well, with the whole ABCD, you're not going to have that because there's independence, but they're working together. So the reverbs should be, you don't want to hear it, you don't want to make it sound like the guitar came in from, you know, Oklahoma and just called their part in. I mean, you want, you want the glue. Right? You want everybody working together, so the reverb should be shared. Mm. Next question. Awesome. Uh, this kind of goes back to the one that we just did, but there might be something interesting in here. This is from uh, My Beard is Bigger Than Yours. Uh, <laughs> okay. <I> have a beard. <laughs> How do you reinvent yourself and stay relevant every year? Uh, which you kind of answered before. I've, but... I've kind of answered that. It just never stay in the safety zone for, for, you know, for too long. Yeah. I liked uh, a couple other parts of this. So do you practice, as Tony Maserati says, um, do you do anything for practice outside of like regular just mixing? Practicing like what? Like mixing, you know. Do I practice mixing? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm mixing. Right. I, I, I'm, no. Yeah. If, I, <laughs> if, I'm, <laughs> if I'm experimenting <laughs> on a new idea, I might sit down and try something new but otherwise i'm experimenting with a song that's appropriate for the ideas i'm trying to get yeah awesome uh do you study the competition no and do you think you're done learning well that's a dumbass question <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think you already know that i i i, I mean that respectfully mm -hmm. i mean to me that is just like how can you say I've stopped learning? I mean, once you once you think you can stop learning, then you know that little sand mm. timer is officially turned over, and you can watch your career, you know, mm. and your creativity just going down, 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 grain by grain. I mean, if you're if your point if your point where it's like I don't need to be learning anymore, then you're probably sick of what you're doing you've probably become pretty jaded and you don't care anymore, right? I love mixing. I love a good song. Music is always evolving, both from a musical standpoint and a technical, technological standpoint, right? So here I am, I'm all in the box. I think I'm still current, technic. And from a musical standpoint, I'm always going after new artists. I'm always making myself available to those who are not uh, signed to a big label. And I'm still having a lot of fun. So um, the idea of, first of all, I 
I'm always curious. I've always been curious. So I, it's not in me to say I don't need to learn. I'm not, I don't want to learn anymore. If that, if that day comes, then I'm done. I'm, say, I'm going to say goodbye. You know, I love what I did. I'm on to something else, right? But um, I, I just can't imagine being in that position where I'm like, I don't need it anymore. I mean, <laughs> that's just not me. That's not my character. That's a great answer to a question you didn't like. <laughs> that was a really good answer. Okay, okay. awesome. Uh, this is from David London, and he says, what is it about any reverb character or quality that you seek and consider to be good for any particular sound source? So how do you choose reverb? Oh. <laughs> Boy, you're asking technical questions. I mean, I mean, I don't even, I have six different reverbs going on. I have a short, I have a medium, I have a long, I have ethereal ones, and then on, and, and those return, right? The, the sends, and I've got the five or six returns. Along with those returns that maybe, maybe one is my alti verb. Well, I've got four different ones that I've gotten to really love that are now uh, bypassed or disabled. And depending on the record I'm doing, I'm like, oh, I would love to hear that sunset you know, like Ross Hogarth did some presets, you know, for the sunset. Mm. Oh, my God, I love that plate. And I, I just specifically use, you know, his. Or maybe, you know, there's the Motown reverb. Like, oh, my God, that's so perfect for what I'm doing. And, you know, so they're there. They're already there. But, you know, they're bypass, And I just undo and I go to that one. And for that record, I've got the Motown plate or I've got some other plate. For me, it's fun. Mm -hmm. It's really fun. I don't I don't think about much more than well what would be cool for this record? Is it a short plate? Is it a chamber? Is it a room? You know, is it something weird? <laughs> you know. So that's how I determine is what's what's appropriate for the record. There's records where what I'm getting has already got everything it needs. I don't need to be adding reverb and and delays and stuff because they kind of they already did it and it's right. And there's other records that just you don't even turn on any reverbs because it's not going to be, you're not going to get your depth from reverb. You're going to get your depth from different forms of compression or what Chad Blake is the king of, of how he uses his distortion. Then distortion, he can just put it, maybe some, he'll use delays to, to create that kind of depth and stuff. But he does different forms of saturation and he's not using any verbs on some records, you know, and you're just, you're like, oh my God, that's so mind blowing because it's, it's perfect. So he's one of my favorite. I mean, he's just the bomb. Yeah. All right, awesome. next. Next question is from Artem in Batumi, Georgia. Uh, if a song is good, but you don't feel connect to it, or connected to it, do you always say no? If not, what's your approach to this? I was thinking about that question. Mm -hmm. What did I say on that when, when we were thinking about that? I was, I was like, well, if I'm not connected to it, then in my mind, it's not good. I, I don't know how to associate it. It's like, I like it or I don't like it. Is it good, but I don't feel like I could do it? Well, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, it, if it's good to me, then it means that I can connect to it. So that's the only way I can answer that question. Mm -hmm. Do you, when you're choosing projects, do you ever turn ones down that you don't feel like you connect to on a first listen there? Yeah, because I don't like it. Yeah. So yeah. connect, don't like. Right. Or connect is name. Right. <laughs> you know? Awesome. Okay, uh, next one is from Hector Alavas uh, from Mexico, and he says, what type of saturation, plug-in or hardware, did you use on the vocals of the song X's and O's from Ellie King, and what was your approach? All right, you know, that was over 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and... Um, I can barely remember what I ate for lunch yesterday. So I do have recall notes, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I still have I all the way there. back to probably, oh, many, many, many years ago. And so what did we do? Yeah, so we, we got this question from Mark yesterday and we mm -hmm. looked up those patch records just for you. Wow. Uh, 
So it seems like you molded the vocal into two channels. One was more like a, a traditional vocal approach with a Fab Filter DSR, EQ, uh, 1176 compressor. And uh, that track went to a console channel in the SSL, which you had inserted the Presto compressor. And then you blended that with another lead vocal channel, which you were processing with the ATR 102 tape. And you follow that with the uh, Waves Money Marking uh, Distortion, which then went into a different channel in the SSL console, and you inserted the uh, EAR compressor. <laughs> there you go. <coughs> I had no idea. <laughs> wow, that sounds so clever, doesn't it? <laughs> Who would have thought of that? <laughs> like, read it again. I did. <laughs> Do I remember that I could have ever done that? No, <laughs> because it's an impulse. It just happened. You know, I'm sitting there. I'm like, I want to, you know, how did I come up with that? Did I come up with that? Well, let's see. Um, technically, if I bring this up and break that up, blah, 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 blah. no, I'm thinking, man, she needs to sound a bit nastier, maybe in the choruses, you know, and she's, I got to I want to, I know she's singing with that kind of like that lip going like this, you know, and. And she's got that attitude, but what I'm hearing is a little bit more tame. I'm like, all right, how do we get that nastiness, especially in this section or that section? Well, what's nasty? All right. Well, how about if I throw in, throw in a, an ATR <laughs> with a what is it with a delay on it or something? Um, Who knows? With the ATR tape machine, and then I'll throw Manny's distortion across it. Now it's all nasty and gnarly, and I'm like, okay, well, that's not the main vocal. I'm just going to add that whenever I feel like it. Mm. So it could be a word, it could be a line, it could be maybe, you know, a bridge or something. And I'll just bring that up, and then that, you know, that snarl just starts to show in the track. So, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that. That is the one song that I have used an extreme abundance of compression over everything on everything with a ton of culture vulture. And it worked. Mm. <laughs> it worked. Awesome. Okay. Uh, let's just, I'm going to group a bunch of questions into one here. Um, how are stems affected by doing the Browarize method? So when you have to deliver stems. Okay. So we do something called the stem key, which essentially what it is, is you print a version of your mix before you hit the master fader processing. So essentially after all the ABCD, right there, you make a print, mm -hmm. a, a, a stereo audio print, and then you will grab that stereo audio print, and you will feed it into the sidechain input of the first compressor in the chain, which is uh, the SSL compressor. Mm. And what that does is it tricks the compressor into thinking that the amount of compression that is happening on each stem is the same amount of compression as if you were feeding the whole mix. So when you solo, say, the kick drum to do your stem, the compression in the master fader is not going to change. It's going to react as if the whole mix was triggering it. And then you just go, you know, folder by folder. We, we don't do, you know, all drums, all bass. We, mm -hmm. we like to, you know, do pre-broken down stems. Uh, we'll print each individual track. Shout out, Bounce Factory, yes. Andrew Sheps, Lifesaver. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Lifesaver, time saver. Money saver. Everything Money saver. saver. Uh, and then that's that's pretty much it. Now, if if you then grab all of those stems and put them in a blank session and compare them to to the mix, is it gonna be a hundred percent? No, but it's gonna be pretty damn close. Mm -hmm. And it's just a deliverable. So now I have to say, when when we were using the UAD version of the SSL, unfortunately that one doesn't have a sidechain right. input. Right. So there was a while there. Uh, that we just had to stop doing that. We would just print the stems, uh, like I said, one by one, but without any sidechain compression. Um, they were kind of like more, a uh, little bit more over the place, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it was what it was, you know what but, I mean? But sidechain, you want to find a compressor that has a sidechain. Mm. 
if there's a slight difference in sonics between one that has no side chain and one with side chain, which is what I did, I was like, well, it sounds a little bit better. And now all the stems are going to be a little bit wrong, but I don't care. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go down that route. I would go with the one that's got a side chain on it and make your life a lot easier for recalls. Yeah. I'm curious, back in the in the analog days, were you... We had a side chain on the 9000. That, so you were doing kind of a similar thing where you were side chaining the... That comes know. from the analog days. That uh, comes from uh, the analog I just days. figure awesome. out how to do it in the box. Amazing. Right. Yeah. And okay. yeah. But here's the difference, right? You hit, you hit uh, Andrew Shep's little button and then yeah. you go home. Yes. Back at Electric Lady, they would have to run each one individual. Yeah. Right. And then in real time. In yeah. real time. Yeah. And there was always a button that wasn't working. Sometimes it would be the panner. So suddenly mm. my strings are like, you know, when I do the recall and listening, I'm like, strings on the right. What? <laughs> I never did that. You know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then sure enough. There was, you know, a little dirt on the left panner, and then we they'd have to go back in. But you're looking at generally, it was two, two to three hours. Yeah. Let's uh, say three hours per song. But I'm mixing two songs a day. So yeah. I would mix the first song. They'd be taking all the recall notes, right? And, of course, all the automation on the SSL is being recorded. And then I would put that one down and then pull up the next song. And I would be done generally by six o'clock, right? Mm -hmm. I'd mix one in the morning, I'd be done by one, one thirty. pull up the next one, be done by six, and then I would go home. Now at six, they're now printing all the stems for the second song. Mm -hmm. Then when they're done, they pull up, recall the first one, and they have to A, B back and forth mm -hmm. between the print and make, making sure that the recall is right. And along with the, the recall notes, mm -hmm. you know, my, my, all my analog gear, which I generally, I stopped touching, mm -hmm. right? So that the recalls were easier. And then another three hours. So you're looking, you're looking at an extra six to seven hours after I go home. So from six until one or two, yeah. they were doing recalls. It was just so inefficient and mm -hmm. absolutely exhaustive for these guys, right? Um, it, it was so... Longer I mean, than it was for you to mix the song. Yep. Yeah. It, easily. Yeah. It no. took them, you know, I, yeah. Yeah, the recall alone was the amount of time that it, that I did. Now, now the thing with that is that as long and painful as that was, it would have been worse not doing it because then the next morning there, there are mixed revisions on that song, but he needs to mix another song. What mm -hmm. are we going to do? Like recall the whole thing. So we were doing... The difference, the key difference is back then we were doing those stems so that we could use them to make mixed revisions right. from those stems right. without going back to the analog. Nowadays, because we're in the box, those stems that are being printed are just for the deliverables. I'm yeah. not going to make a, a revision from those stems if I can just open the session. Right, right. Right. Way more efficient. Awesome. Okay. Next question. Next question. Uh, I think that we should switch over to the live chat. Oh, great. Thing. Yeah. Let's, Let's go. Let's go. All right. Cool. So um, let's see. Okay. So Mohammed Al Tully uh, asks You put the God Particle plugin in your template that you put in Pure Mix, but you did not talk about it in the educational videos. What do you think of this plugin and how do you use it? Well, the fact that I'm using it means I like it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I use it a bit differently. You know, the way Jason, he came up with that to replace all the other stuff he was putting across the stereo bus. But he came up with a, a combination. Um, and I tried that a couple of times where I just turned everything, all my stuff off, and I was mixing it. But to me, it's foreign, right? Jason is, is compiling what he lives with every day. And... I, I couldn't quite do it that way because it didn't. It, I, I couldn't recognize my mix quite well enough. It, it, there was just a lot of other artifacts going on that I wasn't familiar with, right? So, but I loved the sound. 
So what I would do is I would keep my SSL, I would keep my germanium, and then if I had maybe other EQs or other, maybe a Studer across it or something, I would remove those, and then I would put in the particle at 75%. I tried a lot of different things. I tried 30%, 40%, and you know, over several songs, times that I was mixing, and I ended up at a happy place for me at 75%. And then the limiter, which is such a cool sound, that's usually, I might drop that down a little bit if it's pushing a little too hard, right? And in all those early days, um, early days of, of learning how to incorporate the particle into my mix, I would always have Fernando listen and say, okay, what, what do you think? He's always been my sounding board for many years. Um, it's great to have that luxury, having somebody who goes, you know, I like this, or I wouldn't, you know, I would do this, or you know what, you know, maybe try this in the chorus. I was like, awesome, I like the idea, I keep it. I don't like the idea, I don't, I don't keep it. You know, it's experimental. But with a with a particle, um, there would be times where he would say, okay, say, I I like it, but I don't like it because it's changing the feel now. Because sometimes I would just pop it into the chorus. Like that's what quite I often what I'll do is like this feels really good, but now I want like a, a, a sonic soundscape change, right? And I'll pop it in, and then suddenly the feel changes a bit. Um, and there are times where I was like, well, maybe I'll put it through the, across the whole song, and then he'll listen. And he'll go, you know, that sounds too pop now, like what you had before, right? There was a there's mm -hmm. a record I was yep. doing. And so I was like, I kind of like it. You know, I go, you know what? I'm going to send both versions. And I, mean, I, think I, would, I think I was throwing it in the chorus only, maybe. No, I think it was across, it was the, whole across the whole thing. So I sent both versions, right? And they all agreed with Fernando that whatever this second version wasn't quite right for the song, right? So... Um, you know, you just play with it, but I love it. I mean, I use it often, and when I want kind of a scene change or I want exactly what it's got to offer, I'll do it. But quite often, I'll play with the limiter level, right? Mm -hmm. As I bring the level, uh, limiter level down, you know, that's right near the output at the bottom right, um, then it'll, you know, it, it'll change that intensity to maybe a little bit more calm and stuff. It's it's really, really fun, really. And it looks cool. It really looks. That's one of the coolest GUIs out there. Yep. Awesome. All right, next one's from G. Uh, he says, anyone who's seen Michael actually mix on an SSL knows how he plays the board like an instrument. How is he doing that in the box? Does an S6 feel like a console? And how about console one? OK, well. When I had my S6 and I had my 32 fade, faders, I was I, I couldn't feel any difference, right? There is a delay. There's a question somewhere in there about, you know, yeah. you know, we have we have it down to about 300 milliseconds still. Eventually this will be removed. Somebody will invent something that technology will allow us to be maybe 100 or 50, who knows. We should but, explain that real quick, like what that delay is between the fader. Okay, why don't you explain mm -hmm. it, and then I'll go well, from my musical end yeah. on this. With, with the amount of processing that we're doing, each plugin inherently adds some uh, delay to the system. So, like, if, if you're in Pro Tools, if you do like you know Command Two and open like the session settings, mm -hmm. you can see what delay. Um, I think the default is it comes in in samples, but you can change it to show you milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So that's that's mm -hmm. where the 300 comes from, like 300 milliseconds. Yeah. Um, so when you are automating the faders, like Michael is doing right in them, you have that in that inherent system delay. So if you move the fader up, it takes 300 milliseconds or whatever your delay in your system is to, to react. So at the very beginning, when he was getting used to it, kind of like confused him, yeah. but then I mean, he'll explain it, but now like sort of like his mind just compensate for it. So he's he's reacting even though there is that 300 millisecond, uh, his mind and, and his hands are just reacting in, in time to to the music anyway. Um, sometimes if we are uh, processing heavy heavier than than usual, maybe with like some ozone or something, 
uh, I, I will usually try to uh, commit or print stuff down to bring down that system delay to mm. what he's already used to. Right. Yeah. And trust me, I got real grumpy in the beginning, mm. right? Because I don't know what's going on. All I know is I'm doing this and then I'm getting that, right? And I'm like, what's going on here? What have you done, Fernando? <laughs> you know, I'm like, like I, it's like there's something wrong here. Fix it, you know? And, and it was back when Steve was still with us, too. And they're like, you know, there's a 300 milliseconds. That's not good enough. I wanted it 50, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And we talked to a lot of people, you know, and then eventually they were like, with what you've got going on, you should be happy you're down to 300. And and I was like, that's it? That's the answer? I'm stuck until some new technology you're going to have to. And I was like, fine. So I'm like, Rrr. and then slowly over the months, it just started to blend in. And I would predict, I would just move it. it, it to the point, yeah, I mean, just a 300 milliseconds, you're talking about a third of a second? Come on. You know, the brain and your hands should be able to look ahead a little bit. A third of a second, that's not much to look ahead. If you just, you know, have, have the mindset that you need to be starting to think a little bit ahead, and then eventually you're not thinking about doing that because you're just doing it. So... um. You know, and until they can figure it out, and again, because of the processing I'm going, 300 is, you know, a good day. And and if things start to feel too slow, um, you know, then we print. But if it's across a stereo bus and it's just got really bad, I leave it off until I've done all my moves. Mm. Because you, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to enhance the overall sound. Okay, I could live without that and make my moves. Because, and what are the moves? Generally, the real fast ones are gonna be all my vocal levels, right? And then maybe my guitar solos, because I like to ride the solo, like I'm playing the solo, or, you know, try to vibrato it or something. So I, you know, all these things, I, I don't want any more than 300 milliseconds. And then once I'm all done with that, I pop in the, that slow maker, and mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, let it print. Awesome, all right. Great, uh, great answer. Anything else that you want to add about the S ones or anything? Or, um, well, look, you know, I had an S six. There's no way I could get the S six into my house. Mm. That thing is about four hundred pounds. I could never get it down the, the the stairs. I mean, it just wouldn't happen. And and the room isn't quite big enough. So I got three S ones. Mm. What's the difference? Look, the S six for me is like the Rolls Royce, right? S1 is Rolls Royce, but you got roll up windows. Maybe no AC, you know, but it's mm -hmm. still a Rolls Royce. You know, can I can I live without the metering? Yes. Can I live without the center section, which you can buy? You can buy the meters, you can buy the center section. I mean, it was great. I could hit a button and I'd go back like four bars and you know. There was like all cool little things. Can I live without you've, it? You've programmed some of those on your oh, yeah. keys though. I've actually have uh, that's right. I have one button. As I push it, it scrolls back. Um, I've been able to do, you know, with those little buttons on um, fine, and and I don't miss it at all. And I'm never looking at meters, and I'm not, and I don't have the monitor in front of me, as I'm sure you all know from the video we did, that my monitor is to my right. Um, and so I'm just mixing, you know, I'm just mixing. And I, I in the in the first year, I had a second monitor. It was my my TV, and on the TV I had a a bus, B bus, C bus, D bus, uh, some of the main main compressors for the vocal. Right, it was a huge thing, and I was looking at that just so that I could see what's going on. Because when I used to mix on an analog, right, I could always look back. I could just look back and see my A B C D. Just as a, at a glance, I could confirm what I was hearing. But Anytime I turned back, it was just confirming what I was hearing. Like, oh, I think I'm compressing too much. I looked back, oh yeah, I am. You know, I would bring the submaster down a little something. And so for the first year I had all this, so they'd always have to have all those ready into the second monitor. And I found myself just not looking at it anymore. And, and 
I don't like that stuff in front of me. I just want speakers and nothing else, right? Nothing in between the two speakers. And eventually, I know something came up with it, that monitor. Oh, that was creating a huge, huge delay, right? Yeah, yeah. No, mm. Not system delay, but like a, like a visual delay. There was something with, with the um, monitor and the HDMI and the system we couldn't yeah. figure out. Making me yeah. crazy. We had a tech come in, spend all day to figure it out, you know, and then he went, <laughs> and like the problem went away. I was like, oh. It's fucking TV. <laughs> <laughs> all that money for the, <laughs> I said, I don't need no stinking monitor. You know, and at that point, you know, we tried it actually on, on the one monitor and I was like, what, what am I doing? I know, I know the sound. I definitely, definitely think that until you get used to it, you should have a second monitor and you should have A, B, C, D on it. Mm. I really, truly, you should do it until what, what you think you hear, you can actually see as a confirmation, mm. right? I don't have to do that. I, I, I don't have to do that. But you should. So if you have the ability to get a second monitor, you should have your A, B, C, D on there, and you should have your uh, the lead compressor. It doesn't matter, any one of the compressors of the, for the vocals as an indicator of how much it's compressing because you don't want that thing compressing much. These are the tone makers. They're not, the com they're not compressing. They're not meant to be compressing your vocal. They're, they're meant to be compiling a beautiful vocal sound. So you don't want more than one dB except for the ones that are wacky, right? So I definitely recommend a second monitor until every time you look at it, it's confirming what you're hearing, right? But until then, you should probably have a visual um, just as a confirmation as you're developing your ear for this approach. Next. Awesome, okay. Um... Hi, Michael and Fernando. Plugin Alliance just released the Extressor Distressor emulation. We literally were talking about that today. <laughs> I knew somebody wasn't over here. It says up. it has the British mode. Yep. Right. Check it out. So, oh, check it out. We are going to check it out. He checked it out. And, you know, remember with, with ABCD, we use tone. So, when he's using tone, it was completely inaccurate. Yeah, I haven't, but I haven't had the time to listen to it. I can't comment on the sound. I open it up after installing for like five minutes through some tone and try to calibrate it. So we had a start point and it was giving me difficulties. It's not reacting how the hardware or the UAD that we use reacts with the calibration. So I don't know if... So, so with that in mind, if you try to put in my settings that I've given you for the UAD, it's not going to work. So um at the very least we're going to start playing with that because i really want the british mode but i might also call the guys at plugin alliance and and see if they you know just get some information as to why it's not reacting the same way it might be you know some simple changes that you know might be updated who knows yet i i can't say anything because what's most important is can we get it up to the point where it sounds just the way the original distressor sounded with the British mode because the British mode was very important to my drum sound, and and without that, I've had to have the wet dry um, uh, balance pretty much. Again, so like at around one o'clock or something. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of transients going through because I don't have the British mode, so. Um, yeah, so we'll see. I mean, I'm I'm very hopeful for it, but on initial, just putting in the same exact calibration, it's totally different. Awesome. Okay, uh, next question is from Dario. He says, hey, Michael, um, I always wonder about uh, the sound of John Mayer's album that you mixed. Was that your sound proposal or his petition? Well, it depends which album. And the two albums that I did mix was split between me and Manny. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know which one are you in particular. You know, again, on um, what the way it was recorded um, and how, how much time was spent 
on getting those sounds right by both Steve Jordan, John, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> the band, Chad, you know, on on uh, the engineer, on what I ended up getting was already unbelievably great. What did I do? I, I enhanced what was already great there, you know. Um, but it was already unbelievably good sounding. Awesome. Uh, G asks, which channel strip are you using? You endorsed both the Console One 9000K and the Plugin Alliance 9000J. Or are you actually using some, or are you using something else now, like the Actuality SSL Native 2? I don't know. Plugin Alliance. Mm -hmm. Plugin Alliance 9000. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Stefan Wessel asks, Hi, Michael, do you use the uh, SoftTube Console 1 in any application? No. No. All right. Uh, one of the other ones, this is a quick one while I look for the next one, favorite uh, stereo bus compressor. The, the gold question. <laughs> You mean if I was stuck on an island? First of all, I wouldn't get myself on an island. <laughs> and if I was on an island, that's the last piece of gear I'd have because there'd be no electricity. I would go for a nice big Italian submarine sandwich on a daily. <laughs> all right. With all that set aside, what is the one compressor that I've been using for many, many years? The Germaniums. So I like those. I like it. It feels really good in that one setting. I've never touched that setting. When I first bought those, the, the hardware version, they sat in my rack for almost two years. I never used them because I had, in my rack, I had three different stereo compressors or four different stereo compressors. I had my 670s, the, the uh, ADL 670s. I had... Very mute. Very Mew, mm. I Shadow had Hills. the what? Shadow Hills. The Shadow Hills, and oh, I also had the API, the modified API 2500s that uh, Paul Wolf modified for me, that somebody has when I sold it, and then the Germaniums. And so what I would do is I would just, I had an AB button, so I could easily go between two different compressors as opposed to having to do the patch. It was like instant, because that's the only way I can really hear if I'm gonna like something. You know, I, I, the time to wait, you know, my mind will trick me. So I had an A, B button and I would go back and forth and the Germanians just never, never did it. And I don't know, I, had, I didn't have quite the setting, but I was about to get rid of them. And then some project came up, I don't remember which one it was, and I was like, ah, oh, you know, and I just played with it a little bit more and I, put the knob on, the little toggle switch on dirty, and I gave myself m more of a parallel than I would normally have done. And I was like, these sound unbelievable. And then I'm thinking to myself, it must have been age. It ha they must have aged because it was so obvious how good they sounded to me. I said, the, they must have just had to sit in the racks and heat up and just age for a couple yeah. of years, right? Wow. And, but the fact is that when one of them went bad and, and you know, then I got the replacements, they were just fine. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it was. It was the mind was ready for the Germaniums. But yeah, those, they're really special. They're really great. It's awesome. Another great answer to a question that you're like, <laughs> another great answer. Awesome. Uh, this is a wonderful question. Nick's Corsair S1 Tips asks, also, how's the vocal plugin development coming on? <sighs> you mean the vocal, the vocal plugin? Yeah, the yeah. Uh, briefly mentioned in the yeah, video. That's yeah, that's... That's in talks. Mm -hmm. I actually have, um, I've had a couple of s s false starts, um, but I am in talks with one person, one company who is very interested. And it's a matter of that 
some of those favorite compressors of mine are going to need to be modeled first. So I think it might it might even turn into a combination mm -hmm. of two different companies. But once we do it, um, it's going to be really exciting. I mean, it's been it's been really tough. I mean, mm -hmm. trying to get somebody to to do the brow rise, um, you know, to me that's going to make it so much easier when for some a lot of that is already in one box just like just the way Jason kind of put everything into his box and you know and Joe Ciccarelli did a lot of his stuff in his mm -hmm. you know and and there's but of course the ABCD is a much more complicated form of matrix that has to be done it's it's tricky nobody has jumped on board for that one yet but the vocal chain is going to be cool and that's that's in the process and it's going to be very simple you know it, it's going to have what well i don't even know yet anyway mm -hmm. it's it's moving forward let me put it that way nice. all right uh d war says do you know what happened with adl anthony demaria labs it was that was all the buzz 20 years ago um, what happened to it? Yeah. Well, he decided yeah. to to get out of that. Mm -hmm. He was a good friend. He modified my LA3A, so, and I still have that one. I haven't sold that one yet. Mm -hmm. Probably won't. Um, so that I have LA2A cans in there and LA3A cans. Um, and then he, you know, he built the 670, and then he modified that one for me. Um, but he he got tired of it um he wanted to move on and um and i think i think it he sold it maybe i, I don't he sold it somebody else mm. is taking care of it but mm. you know he's loving life and he's a chef um he loves to cook uh, so he's a happy guy awesome okay um let's see i'm gonna grab one more so Guys, I think we're getting to the end of our questions here. If you have a question that you asked earlier in the chat and we haven't gotten to it yet because I missed it in the scroll or something, put it in the chat right now. Um, and I'm going to go back to some of the pre-submitted ones. We'll see what pops up in the chat in the next couple of minutes, and then we're probably going to be heading out of here. So, cool? All right. All right. Um, OK. The last one from in here. While we're doing this, mm -hmm. I, I think we should just one just focus a little bit on the importance of how you're going to gain the tracks into the <coughs> folders. Okay. You mm -hmm. know, I think we really should spend, while you're looking, yeah. I think Fernando should explain it because if you get that wrong at the beginning, and, and from questions that I've had where people are, are writing me directly, it's it's really related to that. It's so important that you get your gain stage going into the folders the right level. So Fernando understands it way better than me. Um, why don't you, if you can show an example of what you would do, um, just so that you get some kind of like a, a visual. I mean, can you show also with just the the uh, Pro Tool session or well, something. I don't or... have any tracks here, but while he pulls that up, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. For you? While he's doing that, yeah, kind of. I think in a similar vein, when you first sit down at the console to mix, um, what are some of the first things that you do? Do you already have the session prepped up uh, by Fernando or somebody? And you know, it's either, it's either. Well, now it's Alexon that preps all my sessions. Mm -hmm. um, but what I always have her do is a fader match. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason for the fader match is twofold, maybe threefold, is one, this is a way to make sure that there's nothing missing. And this is a fader match to the rough mix? A, a right? fader match to the rough mix, mm -hmm. right? So that when I put that up, when she puts it up, if there's a guitar solo missing, she will know because she's trying to do a fader match. She's trying to get it to mm. sound like the rough mix. If there's important effects missing, this is the time when she's going to go like this. If things are in mono, if it mm. sounds like it's like this, but the rough mix is super wide, we're going to want to know what caused some of that, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm trying to basically start where 
the roof ended mm -hmm. in many cases. The other cases where that's not the yeah. really the job. Um, but from the standpoint of of making sure that we have all the correct stems, a fader match is the way to do it. That's not one. Number two, by learning how to match, she is now really learning how to mix in a sense. And I think Fernando, jump in on that because I was, I spent a lot of time with you. There were times when I say, the artist would say, I love this mix. I, I want everything I'm hearing now, but now do your thing to it, mm -hmm. okay? So if I'm trying to restart it from scratch um, yeah. and do my own thing, they're not gonna like it because that's not the task they're asking for. They're asking for, I want this, but make it better, all right? Mm -hmm. And so I would have, an, and especially with something sensitive, like maybe some jazz or something, you know, I'd say, okay, Fernando, give me a may I, which is a match and improve, but he wouldn't do the I, he just mm -hmm. match. Mm -hmm. <laughs> match this, and I'm gonna go through this, and I do not wanna hear any difference because the artist wants it from this point. Mm. And so we'd sit there, right? And then and then I'd be listening and I would go, Fernando, don't you hear this? <laughs> right? I go, he go, what? I go, listen to the roads. Listen to the width on it, or listen to the depth. I, I don't remember. I mean, you can use an example where Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah, when I when I was learning, when Michael was teaching me this like many years ago, matching matching a, a pre-existing mix is really an art because I find that a lot of mixers will want to start their mix and build their, their levels however they want, which is completely valid. But then when you have to match exactly a pre-existing one, it becomes a, a different task, a, dif it's a, a different feel. channel. It's not yeah. just, it's just not, it's not just sonic and balance, it's feel. Yeah. Yeah, so by, doing these exercises of setting up these mixes for Michael and having to really, really, really match these rough mixes. And we're talking about like, when I started to get him better at it, like if I'm like, if, if the whole match is like almost perfect and like that one road is like 0.3 dBs off, he's gonna be like, that's not a match. And, and he was right, that's not a fucking match, right? right? So <laughs> by learning that, um, as a way of you know uh, using the prepping as an as an exercise mm. and as a tool, once I get through that, besides my ears having been like expanded exponentially, <laughs> yeah. like the ear training that that gives is insane. When then I would go back and do a mix of my own, I think when when I was doing that process is where I really started seeing exponential jumps in my mixing. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, damn. Right. I get it, right? right. Uh, so now with our new right. assistant, Alex, and she's going through that process. The pain. Yeah. The pain. Yeah. I don't know. I yeah. don't hear the but difference. But that must have had a huge impact when you were going to make the template, too. I mean, just that specific ear training that you were doing. On well, the, but oh, that's yeah, what he and, had. Of course. That's, yeah. that's a very good point, Mark, is that, that by the time... But I had full confidence in Fernando at that point. Right. Right? right. I'm saying, okay, match it. He knows I don't mean technically or sonically, yeah. it's got to not only be sonic, but it's got, does it, how does it feel? It has, to, that 33609 has to feel just mm. like my 33609. <coughs> mm. And he had the hardware to A-B it against. It wasn't yeah. like a memory thing. He yeah. he had the real deal. So he would be doing, you know, the, the emulation and then comparing it to the real deal. Mm -hmm. So he had that to go back and forth. And yeah. then he got to the point where it sonically sounded right, but it didn't feel the same. Yeah. So now how do you how do you go from there? That's experience. Like, okay, it doesn't feel, how do I get to that feel point? Mm -hmm. And I would just, you know, I would point things out and I'd leave, point him in the right direction, right? Yeah. But, but the rest was all him learning and, and what, <laughs> You know, obviously he understands this now, but that forced him to become just an unbelievably good mixer listener who yeah. can interpret, you know, who can sit there. And when he would nail that, I'd be like, God, 
I could have never done that, you know? I mean, it's yeah. just, yeah. you know, that's the level that he attained, which which takes time and patience and, and confidence. And Alexon, you know, is just at the, you know, she's on base one of that, right? Yeah. She's at 101 on it. So so what's with her, she can do a, a great comparison, you know, on one song, it's like pretty much nail, and the next one is just not even in the ballpark. And like, what? What's different? What am I doing? You know, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm like, yeah. Dr. Fernando, man, I don't know. I, I don't know what to tell you. It's not the same. You know, yeah. so right. but that part of that, there's 90 percent of the time or 95 or 98. I'm not starting a mix with the faders up. Yeah. I'm putting all the faders in, but I'm doing that to force hmm. her to learn. Yeah. So and I haven't been doing any of that. Hmm. Like I don't listen to the fader matches because I just want to, you know, be start starting to mix. But now I'm like, she's at that point where I'm like, okay, so uh, just listen to your fader match. Eh. You know, yeah. she's like, oh. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so now I'm like, every song I'm gonna, I'm like, okay. It's a fader match today. Mm. It's a fader match today. Every day for the rest of your life is a fader match, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's just a matter of time. Yeah. You know, she has the smarts, she has the ability, she has the musicality, but she doesn't have the experience. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very very tough, right? Yeah, it's very tough, but you have to be patient. Yeah. That's we've been talking a lot um, just around around pure mix about uh, things that we can do to try and like encourage practice exercises like that and that one sounds pretty good just to, to match the rough that's yeah that's there's, awesome. there's a few drills that i do when i'm teaching seminars all types of you know there's a few different ways i haven't done that one because that takes a lot of time but um yeah it's it's a good one yeah it's a good one because it really develops your ear yeah i mean you're doing this to make me happy because i'm saying to you i want a fader match mm -hmm. So you, you know, you're following my direction because I want that. Yeah. But the rewards is just right, right. Yeah, great. Training. All right. Okay. So let's let's just quickly explain to everybody yeah. out there the importance of how you're going to start the gain stage. Yeah. So there, there is there is a few different gain staging points that you have to be aware of with the template. The first one starts at the audio track level, right? The multi-track, the stems that you're, that you're receiving. And from some of the questions, um, I would love to be able to give you a number and be like, this is the number you're gonna hit, you're gonna be good. I just can't do that because it is, 100% a feel and an experience thing. I just know when it's right and I know when it's wrong and I know if you're just starting to use this, it might not be that helpful, but I'm gonna try to sort of like put it into words. So with this session, for example, this is a mixed session, um, all the audio tracks, right, that, that we've uh, put into our, our folders, all of those audio tracks, before I put them into the folders, I've done a, a group. And that group I assign to a VCA that I that I have down here. Uh, why is this not closing? There you go. Um, this audio trim VCA. Uh, I will deactivate the, the group settings so that, you know, if I'm soloing one track, it's not like the rest are soloing. I'm, I'm just using the group to be able to uh, assign all those audio tracks into this audio trim. Now, if you get your audio tracks and you play them all together and maybe you put the, the meter that you like and you are seeing that these pre-mixed tracks are already coming in way too hot, you know you're gonna have to trim them down to begin with. And it can also be the opposite where you put that, that meter at the beginning and you are so low, you can barely hear the tracks that you know you're gonna have to, to gain them up. The thing that you can use as an indicative is 
where the position of the folder faders are. So for example, I get a sense of if the audio tracks are too, too, too loud or too quiet, I do my initial trim, and then I start doing the fader match. And as soon as I'm trying to match the reference mix instantly, like maybe I've just constructed the drums, I can see that my faders, my folder faders are all the way up, um, then I know that I need to trim the audio higher so that that those audio tracks are hitting those folders louder, which then means the faders come down. Are in a happy place. Yes. Which is why I'm saying on the, on the fader, the number, you know, you've got everything from plus 12 down to infinity down, right? So I like to be somewhere around minus five, between minus five and zero. And here's a song right now, right, that he's put up, and my faders are around zero, minus seven, minus eight. So they're all for me in a really happy place. What would not be happy is if I had him down around 40 or if I had him at plus six because I have no, no, nowhere to go. And the great thing when you're mixing into compression is that you, you don't just tweak your little faders and hear it. With my approach, you can move those faders like an inch, right? So if you're already way up at six, where's that inch? You're slamming up at the top. You've got no headroom to go. And same thing if you're way at the bottom, you're like, you're like, you know, you know, because between the bottom and and twenty, this, it's not, it's not discrete. I mean, it's not uh, what is it? The, the slight. Yeah, like the, Incre like it's the not incremental. incremental. It really starts moving really fast. Yep. So, again, from the time that I was mixing on a Neve to an SSL to a, to an SSL four thousand from a four thousand to um, and five thousand to a six thousand to an eight thousand, then eventually a nine thousand. They all have different sweet spots. Whether it was I'm on a Neve or wherever you are, so you find that sweet spot. Well, this is a control surface, right? But you still have to find the sweet spot on the desk because they're faders. You want to be able to ride the faders. So, so I still, the concept is still just like an analog desk. And so that area between minus five and zero is where I want Fernando to, to have the session come up. And that's what he means when he goes, if he starts to doing a fader match, and he's all the way up here, then he's going to trim up that initial s tweaker down there, another three or four dB or five dB. But if he finds himself that that in order to do a fader match, now let's let's keep something in mind too. He doesn't have to look at it because he hears it, but you should be look. You should have A, B, C, D open up in an on another monitor because as you're trying to do the fader match, if it's slamming. You're slamming the compressors. You're pushing them really, really hard because you're, you're going into ABCD way too hard. So you want to be able to have the faders in that sweet spot between minus five and zero where they're not slamming ABCD or they're, on the other hand, you don't want them so that they're doing nothing. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and also for like the comfort of writing, if you are at the sweet spot, a move like this is like, you know, between three, four, five dBs, but like the same amount of move when you have the fader on the down position, that same move, it's 20 or 30 dBs, right? right? So the important thing is that it is a snowball effect. Mm -hmm. So these are all, the, these are all the, the points where you can control your gain staging. The first one being the audio trim, which is pre the folders, which means that uh, moving that is going to affect the inserts that you're putting on the folder. So right. be mindful of that. So once you, you get that set up and you, you do your, your uh, fader match or, or your mix and, and your faders are in the right position, if those faders are in the healthy level, that's just going to translate to you opening up A, B, C, D, and you see those compressors being hit in the, uh, in, in the right way. Mm -hmm. Now, your next gain staging point 
would be post folders, but pre ABCD, mm -hmm. right? So you, you are hitting the folders right, your inserts there are good, but maybe... But it feels like you're still hitting A, B, C, D a little hard. And that's why I say on every, every day you mix a song, at some point when it's feeling good, you go over to your sub uh, stereo master, the VCA sub stereo master, and then you just you're, maybe play a chorus. Right, play a chorus where there's a lot going on, and then just start bringing it down a little bit and see. As you bring it down just a little bit, it might like get bigger and, and more dynamic. And go, oh wow, this sounds even better. What's happening there? Well, because you were pushing into the compressors too hard and they weren't giving. There was no play. The lack of play, the bounce that that you know I've described to you in in earlier episodes of the videos. That's very very important. So you can immediately feel and hear what happens if you're pushing too hard. So you just bring it down. And then there's going to be a point where it totally kind of unglues and it's like, doesn't feel good. You know, at that point, okay, you've gone too far. Then you go back up and you go a little higher. You go, oh, that doesn't sound good. Or it might. You go, oh, that sounds even better. Okay. This isn't, the rule here is that you must feel good. The rule is not that the meter doesn't look good. Is that it must feel good, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that gain stage. Yeah. Continue. Which, which is the the that VCA eight or that VCA submaster. So that's your that's your point post folders pre ABCD. Mm -hmm. Now uh, we we haven't find a, a need, but if you want to insert a point between the ABCD and the master fader. You could just create a uh, an actual master fader in Pro Tools, which is pre, you know, and assign it to the same bus as the fader aux, mm -hmm. and then you have even one more uh, control point in between ABCD and and, and the master fader uh, processing, and just just be mindful of how you're gain staging in each stage. Each stage has a different um, effect and purpose, but at the end. Everything is gonna is gonna domino. So if you're if you're gain staging incorrectly at any point, you're gonna end up with a, with an undesired result. And again, I know it sounds like oh my god, that's just too much, but just be patient. Just go with it. The result is that all of this becomes automatic. That you're just driving, right? You're just flying the plane. And all the stuff, the computers and all the other stuff that you never have to think about are doing their job properly. But you just have to start the process correctly, right? And, and you'll be fine. Because, you know, because I'm yeah. telling you. Yeah. I'm telling you. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Okay, uh, question from G in the chat. Um, he asks, have you found new compressors in the digital realm that beat what you had in analog? That beats? Beats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably. I mean, well, certainly all the tools, but there was never an analog tool that could do what, you know, Isotope can do. Yeah. A lot of the repair tools, mm -hmm. it's just insane. Yeah. Um, I think it's all just subjective. Like when we, we were talking about this yesterday, like when we've, first started with this whole like migration into in the box our start point was the analog so we were creating all of these chains and these emulations to replicate exactly what we had going on in the analog but then once he actually started mixing into it and adopted like, oh my god i can do this i can do that mm -hmm. then he just um you know opened himself to the tools and then if there's a cool compressor coming out that has mm -hmm. nothing to do with analog, like like who cares? It's just cool. He wants to use it. He wants to put yeah. it. You know. So, right. you know, and a typical example is when Jason came out with the God Particle, or, mm -hmm. or or Al Schmidt came out with his, you know, um, his tool, which I use. Interestingly, not not how it was designed. Mm -hmm. I'll use it in a bridge to completely change the whole feel. And I think I have some kind of variation of a vocal setting on there, but I'll just pop it into a bridge when a bridge is kind of a halftime feel and you're supposed to feel more ethereal. I'll pop Al in there 
and I'll go, I love you, Al. You know, and, then, <laughs> and it'll be thing. And then, you know, the artist will listen and go, whoa, what did you do in the bridge? And I go, thank you, Al. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Okay. Um, this next one's from Iago. And he says, hi, Michael. What are your thoughts about the Procasti M7 versus plug-in emulations of it, I'm guessing? Um, that's, it's interesting. I just looked at, I, I went back to Alto yesterday and I snuck a couple of more analog pieces of gear, you know, I'm like, oh, I, I would love to have that back in my room, you know? Um, and I saw the M7 there. Yeah. And I was like, oh <laughs> man, what a sound that was. But frankly, I haven't sat down and, and, but also the other thing is that the, the plates that I was using were all modified. <laughs> I had, mm. I was trying to copy other plates with yeah. it. So that's generally what I would use. But um, I have not done a comparison test between the hardware and the... Seventh Heaven, I think. Yeah, yeah. I you know, haven't we, done we it. We use the, the Slate Verb Suite Classics. Okay. And, and there's a, an M7 um, impulse responses that you can download for mm -hmm. free that they did for the plugin, they just released later. So we we loaded those up. Because like when we did the template, the the really the main Bricasti sound he was using was the uh, uh this this preset called Clear Ambience. Oh that's right. I use yes. that every day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have take that all, in there. I take that back. Yeah. Sounds great. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've saved that as a preset into my thing after seeing it's, 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 it's not even like really like a so reverb, good. it's just like like an yeah. ambience thingy. It's just yeah. this thing that just opens it up into I use that with percussion a lot yeah. when I want a conga just to kind of feel more like so I can hear it. It's like it's it's like a it, it's one of those little pen lights where you can you know if you can't quite hear an instrument and you start sending that to the clear ambience, it almost it's like putting a little pen light you know you know in the pictures when there's a you know serial killer in the middle of a you know graduation yeah. picture and then there's that there's <laughs> always a serial killer and then they highlight that one person that's what that's like with with the m7 you know you sit there and you go Bing, and suddenly nice. you can actually hear that instrument within this you know huge mix you suddenly has that little space like a little highlight on there nice awesome okay um Dan Yerba asks, hello, Michael and Fernando. How is a mix review with you and the artists? Uh, greeting from Mexico. So, yeah, how do you handle mix mix reviews once you've turned them in? Do you guys have a Oh, you mean mix comments? And I believe mix yeah. comments, yeah. Um, they get done. <laughs> <laughs> they happen. It's a thing. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> okay. Uh, God of Gore 666 says Fernando should totally have his own Q&A sometime. His, his Down, username. If anyone's interested in that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I never. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think it's actually the devil that wants you to do that. So take that as you will. OK, um, Sonic Discovery asks a couple questions. So he says, what's your method to address phase issues? Guessing in multi-tracks. Boy, when I first started, I, if you listen to a very, very early interview with me, um, prior to going hybrid, uh, I they would ask me, you know, can we, can you, we do this as hybrid or even in the box? I said no, because there's too many phasing issues. Um, mm. Pro Tools is not at a place yet where they've got the delay compensation right, mm -hmm. and because of the way I work where you've got a combination of, of sending to a processing, but then you got the parallel and they're both going. The sound, it wasn't like an obvious phasing, like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, yeah. it was just this hollowness, right? It mm -hmm. was like, you know, if you, if you took um, Little Labs phase, you know, yeah. IBP. I, I, you know, you, you would need to put that on all the tracks just to do a slight, you know, yeah. a slight change. And so it was it was undesirable, right? It wasn't musical because it it was I was losing the tone. Those were in the early days. So I said, and I was very clear, until they can correct that, I don't, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I'm not I'm not mixing a hybrid yet. I just can't do it because it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. They've pretty much resolved all of that. So 
the only time there might be a phasing issue sometimes is when I have a dry vocal and a wet vocal mm. together. And quite often the dry vocal is going through my whole processing, you know, the, the, the chain. The wet vocal is just a wet vocal. Now, there are times when the, what was done in the wet vocal sounds great, right? But I just want to add mine into it and it just makes it pop a little bit better. Mm. But I like all the delays and the reverbs and the effects. They were loving it. They don't want to lose it. Mm. I, I don't need to reinvent that stuff. But I just want to make it a little pop a little bit more. And there are times when, because of all the processing, it does not work with the dry. So I have to decide wet or do something with the wet. So what I might do is send the wet, the actual wet, and that's how I've been able to address it, is sending the wet to some of my compressor returns, mm -hmm. right? And try to get some of that going on. But there are other times where it's just steadily a bit off, and that's where I put in the IBP. Mm -hmm. And then I just slowly change the phase till it hmm. fills up, wow. and then I'm good. But I don't go doing that with any other instrument because there's never any problem with with the sense of you know going to the 1176s and you know all the parallel compression going on. They got it down, you know. I mean, I you know maybe Logic is better at it, but um, we don't have a. I don't think we run into a problem no. like that. Just, and just to clarify, oh, when he was talking about the dry and the wet vocal, just so nobody out there thinks we're talking about like like the reverb we're putting or anything, like uh, we get from the client a dry vocal mm -hmm. and a wet vocal with all the processing and effects from the client printed. So sometimes to create the vocal sound of a record, he will make a blend of those two where he has that thing going on that the client had on, on his wet vocal and then he crafts his own vocal with the vocal approach mm -hmm. with the dry and then he blends them sometimes depending mm -hmm. what the client did on the wet that's where where they face and and we address it how he explained it now in terms of facing between bosses or anything like that not at all it just yeah. have your delay compensation on pro tools turn on and uh, it takes care of itself yeah yeah great good question all right uh another question best use of unison comp I'm not familiar with that one, but do you know? Yeah, um, you used to use it. Uh, we kind of stopped. It was that, um, that that like gray compressor with the big knobs that you, you used to have on the, you had that, that California preset that you put on the on the Master Fair kind of like to pop the choruses or something. Oh. It's the gray compressor with the big knobs. Oh, that <laughs> The right. Unisum. I think oh, the Unisum, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Oh. Gosh, I got to go back and look at that again. <laughs> you know, sometimes you move on to other things and then you forget. Um, mm -hmm. And what was the question? Um, best use. So probably what it's you're looking for. I, I think I have one that's called, the preset is called glue factor. Mm. One, glue factor two. Glue one, glue two, California one, California two. Oh, yeah, that's, 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 that's it. That's it. Man. And um, there's a it. certain <laughs> warmth in the lower mid range that really liked. And sometimes when I say it's a glue, it's just, you know, things are just a little bit chaotic and I would pop that across the stereo bus and then mm. I'd be like, wow. You know, and maybe I'm like, I'm not sure. And I would go through the four presets that I've made. And if that works, I'm fine. If I still don't feel it, Take bypass. It like I would do any other compressor, mm -hmm. but it's, it's cool. I just haven't used it in a while. Yep. But now that I've brought it up, I'll probably try that tomorrow. <laughs> of right? course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this was great. <laughs> yeah. His uh, last part of the question is, have you guys upgraded Invisible Limiter to the new version? Oh. Um, maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah. We'll cool. look into that All tomorrow. Right. I mean, yeah. Alex, and shout out to Alex, and she keeps, she keeps all of our plugins updated. Nice. She's much better at it than I was, so yeah, we, yeah, we probably are. You know, you know which one. Every time I open it up, it says "new update, new update." Yep. What is it with a magic eye and its update? It's got <laughs> a million. Every time I open it up, like, and I'll go, "Hey, Fernando, did you didn't you update? Yeah, I just updated last week. Well, it wants an update again. <laughs> update the goddamn eye, would you? Like, what are they doing to this thing? <laughs> 
Okay. That'd be like having somebody come in to work on like your analog compressor every week. You'd like go over to use it and somebody's yeah. back there like with the soldering iron. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, get like, out of here. Come on. on. <laughs> How many changes do you need to make? Yeah. You know, it's what it is. <laughs> Leave it alone. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, I forgot to get the username, but uh, someone has a tip for you on the SSL 9000 plugin from Plugin Alliance. Uh, it's mixed by Dot Rob. And he says, you can tweak it and make the background of it purple, which you thought might be interesting for you. Oh, the GUI? <laughs> yeah. On, on which, the stressor? On the, uh, on the SSL 9K plugin by Plugin Alliance. Um, <sighs> no. Email, email us. <laughs> email us how to do it, please. No, no, I am not going to. No. I want to know. Kind of no, yeah. I know. That, that's just, um, <laughs> there was a big issue about that because it would look too much like the one at Electric Lady, so I'm not going down that road at all. Uh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Next. See. Next. <laughs> You're not supposed to know about that. But for anybody else who wants to do it, I guess you just open the folder of the plugin and you have to tweak the image files. So it's not just like oh, a setting or anything. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, uh, I won't do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Um, there have been a couple questions just asking what your monitoring setup is like. It's pretty simple now. Yeah. <laughs> Three things. I've got my ATC 25s, no subs. I've got my Sony radio that Fernando also has one. I had bought three. One is in storage. One Fernando has, one I have. And I have my headphones. Um, and I usually go from the, eight, the 25s down to the radio, to my headphones back to the big speakers. This is in the final half an hour or something. Mm -hmm. And then um, that's the monitoring. It's very, very simple. And, and it's all on the Oculus, mm -hmm. that old Oculus. That poor knob is like so, <laughs> I can't get that thing not to rock anymore, but mm -hmm. it's perfect. It works awesome. great. It's a like big knob. I still have one big knob. <laughs> Everything this else one is like go. I don't digital, but I turn. have one big knob I can go up and down. It's like, that's all I'm left with. I used to have like hundreds of big knobs all around me. I'm down with one. I have the same monitoring situation like that Michael does, ATC25, same headphones, same yeah. radio. So we're oh hearing gosh. the same thing. Yeah. But uh, a little tip if anybody cares, uh, when you're trying to like, mix something that that you wanted to knock like an 808 or something you wanted mm -hmm. to knock when you're just playing out of the iphone because the iphone has no low end i will finish my mixes on my iphone i mm -hmm. stream with audio movers mm -hmm. the link of my session into my iphone i'll turn off my speakers and i'm literally mixing out of the built-in yeah. speakers of my iphone to make it knock on the iPhone now, put in my AirPods to make sure it's there good. Sure it's all good. Man, yeah. you never told me yeah. that. I'm pretty sure I have. <laughs> uh, holding that on you. I'm glad I know him. <laughs> right. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, Isomatic asks, uh, what type of things or feelings are going through your mind and body when you're trying to connect with the emotion and feel of the track and stay that way consistently? Well, I'm not really thinking about anything, but first I want to hear the story. And then I decide by the story how I'm going to build up the track. Um, I, want, I want to understand and feel good within the first 15 minutes. So quite often, I don't start with drums and bass. I'll start with maybe what it was written on. Let's say it was written on a piano or on a Rhodes. So I'll put the Rhodes up. Um, maybe one other element, a guitar, because it's really an important part, and then the vocal. Mm -hmm. And I'll just get a really good feel about that, and I'm just sitting there, I'm hearing the story. I'm like, oh, this is what the song is about. So this is a song that she's trying to be happy, but she's having an issue that maybe the love that she thinks she has isn't, um, and you can, you know, and it kind of opens up, unfolds into the chorus where, you know, you can feel that the hook is more about, you know, questioning the love. And then in the bridge, and now I'm listening to the bridge, and I'm like, oh, the bridge is, you know, her really 
singing how she feels mm -hmm. and or maybe the changes she wants or maybe the hope. And so I'm listening to all that. And then I start building around that. So, okay, so that's, these are the main elements. But what's the main element in the, in the intro? You know, who's in, what are the three main elements? I always mm. like to keep it very, very simple. That's, I didn't come up with that. That's just plain uh, common sense that your mind doesn't want too many things coming at it. So keep it, keep it simple, even though there's a lot of stuff. And then I build around the verse and the B section. The B section is there to make the chorus feel great. But from an emotional standpoint, I just want to keep building this feel. And if the song is supposed to be a want for happiness, then I'm not going to be mixing it in a way that makes it angry or super poppy and happy, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. that's not the story. And, and you can make it sonically sound great. And the artist will listen to that and go, well, I don't like this. Why? Because, you know, you're making me sound angry. I'm not angry. Mm -hmm. I'm sad. Right. Right. So as I'm mixing, that's all I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking about, about anything technically. What, you know, what reverb. I mean, I've got a bunch of reverbs. I'll throw one up and throw another one. I don't like that one. I don't like that one. And here's try. I don't like that. Oh, this one makes me feel more like the story. Mm -hmm. That's how I'm making those decisions. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, does any does any of that come back from your your days as a producer? I mean, uh, do you... oh man, I wouldn't brag about my production. <laughs> I, I I got that to get it out of my system. I had some success in England with that. Yeah, but no, that just came from my learning to listen mm -hmm. more about what the story, what the story's about, what the singer's mm -hmm. trying to tell you. Um. Yeah, I mean, I became a really, really good arranger. Mm. And by virtue of being working with great producers and mixing thousands of songs, mm -hmm. you become a good producer yourself. But as a mixed producer, I mean, I'm good at producing, deciding to arrange and produce what's in front of me, mm -hmm. not coming from soup to nuts and coming up with a hook. And, yeah, sure. you know, yeah. I realized after a couple of years of that, that that was not going to be ha ever happening in my head, you yeah. know? So, um, yeah, so it, it just comes from thousands and thousands of hours and songs of just different scenarios. And, and I have all these, you know, from way back, I have all these producers who taught me so much that are in my head, you know, mm -hmm. and I'll be doing, and I'll go, okay, I want to hear more of this and this is how you're going to do it, you know? And now I'm mixing something and they show up, yeah. you know? They yeah. say, hello, try this, and I do that. And I go, oh, that's cool, you know? Right. It, it's just like this library of, you know, of experiences. And then there's also quite often... I mean, the, the the whole British explosion that happened, right? When all the, the, the British, the, the records were coming to us, you know, that had these incredible sounds. Quite often when I'm mixing a song, I'm going to go, wow, this band is was influenced by Bloody Valentine or mm. they were influenced by the Kooks or they were influenced by who knows, right? Mm -hmm. Bands that I would know. And I'm like, so, I'm like, oh, maybe I'll mix it so that you get that feel and then you know because i know they were influenced by this band and maybe that band and so as i'm mixing i may have already done those bands and I'll, right. and as i'm doing the blend i'm like you know what i'll eq in a certain way so it just gives it that kind of edge you know and you're not going to go oh that was the kooks but you're mm. going to go something's going to be familiar and the band of course is going to be happy because they didn't tell me that that was their influence but i know that was their influence right. And so there's always that, all of that history of just listening to other, to records, and you know, I'm not studying. I can study when I want, but I'm just enjoying it like everybody else. And then something that's special, it just stays in me. Yeah. And then one day I can recall it because I can analyze. I can go, okay, that felt so good, and why? Well, because of the reverb that was on this and that, 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 that. that. You know, then mm -hmm. I can get like totally technical because. I still have freeze frame of that yeah. sound and then I can just kind of dig in, right? You know, I can't write, I can't produce, I can't do other things, but I can do stuff like that, you know? Right. Um, 
So that's, you know, that's how those things develop. When you're mixing, if you found yourself in one of the situations like, you know, and it wasn't a band that you had mixed, which are, you know, there's not many, but uh, do you ever like go to Spotify in the middle of a mix or something like that? Or just not necessarily Spotify, but like anywhere to just listen to? I, I have done that a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I may do it if some, if the artist is saying, hey, look, this was kind of what we we're looking for. You know, mm -hmm. and they'll just give me a couple of songs. And they'll say, you know, can you just listen to that? This is kind of the vocal sign we were looking for. We got close, but we didn't nail it. Yeah. And then I'll say, okay, so I'll listen to it. And then I'll go, oh, okay. You know, and that's my little analyzing hat comes on. And I'll go, oh, okay. So that, that was probably a 220 delay, maybe going into some distortion. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm just sitting there like, you know, just surfing inside yeah. you know and then, yeah. and then i come back out and i'm like okay yeah right awesome and then uh, but most of the time mm, it's it, it's interesting it's my memory of what i think it felt to me like and so i'm reproducing or replicating what felt my interpretation of what it felt to me like and then if you go back to that i'll go it's not even close yet. I feel that. How did I? What happened? You know. Right. Right. It's weird. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know what I'm talking yeah. about because everything we're doing is a culmination of just all the music that's flying in our heads. That some some of it sticks to the walls, you know, right. and just and just sits there. And as mixers, they're just there, and then we just go bing, mm -hmm. bing, bing. You yeah. know, we just recall them. As, as I'm mixing and they just just flows out of me and again another confirmation that I'm not thinking technically on anything I'm just going I want to reproduce a certain feel right it's and now how do I get there well I've got years of experience on how I know how to play this my instrument mm -hmm. right so I can quickly go to it but I'm not thinking much about it right I'm just like oh I want to do this if, if that doesn't work I, go, ah, I don't care try something else right I'm not hung up on it I'm not soloing I yeah. rarely solo right that's yeah that's always a big topic is the to solo or not to solo thing okay um let's see if we have anybody else in there I think we're just about getting to the end of it um so um, how do you find uh, new music? Like when something grabs you, if you're, let's say you're out, you know, at a restaurant or something, and a song comes on. Well, it's generally not the restaurant, it's my son, mm -hmm. Eric Brower, um, who's in California, works for Dweezil Zappa mm -hmm. right now. Awesome. Um, and he'll call me, he'll go, Dad, you gotta check out this band, you mm -hmm. know? Or uh, there was a time when, like during Christmas, when we're, we like to play backgammon, you know, and he usually is playing the music. And he'll be playing a lot of music, and I'm like, wow, this is really good. Oh, this is really good. And this is really good. And it was like, he goes, yeah, that's Rado. That's Rado who did all that. Oh, yeah, that's his, that's Rado's band. Oh, this is Rado. I'm just like, wow, who is, you know, and it's like, you know, and then Eric would go, Dad, you need, you need to meet Rado, right? Yeah. Um, or lately, I think it was his, uh, Andy Wells, right? And, and I, I was like, you know, so he'll send me music and go, Dad, check this out. Sometimes it's check this out, you should be mixing it. Mm. Or other times, check this out, how cool it is. Mm. So I really get a lot of that from Eric. And and then there are times, of course, when I'm hearing it on, you know, on the radio or in a car or in a mm -hmm. restaurant. But most of that time, I'm not focused on, I'm focused on what's in front of me, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I really don't have my... You know, yeah. radar hat on but but so it's either that and and fernando same thing you know mm -hmm. fernando will say you know i'm listening to something that's really really cool same with plugins you know fernando usually is the first one who's going to say hey check this out mm -hmm. you know but i also get from the companies i get a lot of you know yeah would you listen to my you know yeah and it's it's overwhelming right it's really overwhelming and they'll and i'll just say okay let's install it and then Sometimes we'll spend like three or four hours because there's like seven or eight new plugins and we'll just listen to it and we'll throw it on everything and then we'll do a quick judgment on what do you think? What do you think? Yeah, you like, I like, yeah, cool, right, boom, keep it or, yeah. you know, 
it's too much like something else I already have. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just hmm. thousands of them. I mean, it's like, it's so overwhelming. Yeah. Well, that, let me ask you that then. When you get a new plugin to check out, what are, what are some of the processes for that? You know, so you throw it on everything and then you're listening for the boundaries or, you know, I don't see know. what it does. So well, it's just like anything. Do you like it or you don't like it? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Is this, yeah. is this different? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this different than, you know, is this a variation of what I already have that I'm happy with? Yes. Then I don't need it. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, if there's something new that comes along and I'm like, this is so cool. I mean, you know, uh, Devin just, just recently uh, came up with a 252, you know, the EQ. Right, it's a 252. I think. I think it is. It sounds so good. Mm. Is it 252 or 525? God, I'm so eclectic. Um, Devin, where are you? Tell me. Yeah. But if you go into, let's just see. Is 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 it in the trial rig? Yeah, it probably is. Um, it's what? It's a 252. Okay, great. What an EQ! Oh my goodness! Mm. It's just and it's it's the uh, the knobs on a on a graft. You know, it's a slider. It's a slider knob. Mm -hmm. Oh my god! It sounds so good. <laughs> so you know, when that comes along, I'm just like, wow, this is the, you know, this is so cool. Yeah. All right. Awesome. All right. I think uh, I think we're pretty much to the end of it here. Um, so. One more technical question. Dorian uh, Versus asks, Hi, Michael, could you bring a bit of clarity when it comes to the flooded vocal? Does the dry vocal also feed the A bus on the top of all the vocal compressors feeding E bus? Thanks for everything. No, not, not anymore. It, it hasn't for a while. So the, the, the floated thing was from, from the SSL days, but, but to simplify it, here it just means that the dry vocal um, goes into the, the compressors and uh, the, that dry vocal doesn't have an output in the sense that it's not going out to any bus. Uh, what you're hearing as, a, as the vocal dry is the, the combination of the returns of the lead vocal compressors. Mm -hmm. The lead vocal wet used to go into A we stopped doing that a while ago. We have a dedicated bus called V, <laughs> which is it's 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 unprocessed. Mm -hmm. It's it's literally just for like routing purposes. Yeah. Um, and then the backing vocals do still go malted to A and to D. Right. And the reason why I stopped sending it to A is because it's already processed. Mm -hmm. And now you're processing, you're seeing it more, and A is kind of dedicated to all the sustaining things like strings and piano and you know and and you push a vocal into that and now you're messing the vibe yeah. of the sustainers you know right. it's, it goes back to the whole reason why I came up with ABCD I don't right. want anybody stepping on some you know yeah look the drum the drummer and the bass player we're our thing right yeah. don't mess with us guitar yeah. players they don't want they want to be left alone singers yeah. they want to be left alone yeah so you know, I, I realized that what I used to do with A didn't work in the in the computer, you know, in, in the box approach. Yeah. And so that just goes strictly through to the, to the stereo. Well, to V, which to is v. which is unprocessed. Yeah, right. V yeah, maybe, unprocessed. Maybe I'll stick a DS there once in a while, but yeah, it's just a routing thingy. Awesome. All right. Um, last question. Yeah. From Theo Mac. Uh, are you okay with what mastering engineers do to your mixes? Yes, because I choose my mastering engineers. Yeah. Um, and I've learned, I learned this probably probably from Manny. Um, d well, even before Manny, but as far as level, I think I probably got that from Manny, is that you should be able to mix it so it's mastered flat. Now, that's the way it was. That's what I achieved way back from the beginning. You know, mm -hmm. I was, I, when Greg Calby mastered all my records, mm -hmm. every six weeks, because I was recording and mixing every six weeks, I would come in, 
come to him with a new album done, right? Because yeah. that's wow. that's the time period we used to do them in. Right. And I'd say, okay, what do you think? You know, and then he would say, okay, you know, he'd make comments, and I'd go back, and then six weeks later, I would address the things that he thought, even though it's a different record and everything yeah. else, to the point where he finally, you know, one day said, okay, I am, I've mastered this flat. And that was always my goal from that yeah. point on. Now, what what I hadn't taken into account at that point because it was going to vinyl was level. And so when I was giving them three, four dB of, of, of headroom to the point where they got it, then they would squeeze and limit. And, and so they're now changing the sound. And mm. I was like, oh. Right. And then it would implode my snare. Right. I'm not referring to Greg. I'm just saying yeah. other engineers. When there was a point where labels took that that privilege of me choosing the person who should master my record away from me, right. that didn't last too long because I got pretty grumpy about that. But yeah. um, I was just like, wow. This is this is not good. So I said, all right, I need to give them less mm. less opportunity to futz with because I'm still working at towards it being flat. I am mixing it so it doesn't need extra work. Right. Right. So really what they're doing is tying it all together from one song to song, and then they've they're bringing up the level. And I ended up at that point. I mean, I've been through some many, many great master engineers, but you know, lately in the last several years, I mean, I went to Joe Laporta, and that was, phew, that was almost ten years ago, right? Yeah. When I did, uh, what was that first band? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and I was like, wow, he really gets it. He mm -hmm. really gets it. And then we, I would learn from him. Like, you know, what level can I give you? You know, how much headroom would you want? He goes, you know, just give me like a couple of dB or a dB would be fine. I'm like, okay, so, you know, and I said, and what's that level? And it was only in the last year or two that we started thinking luffs, right? Mm -hmm. Until then it was, you know, plus nine or... Yeah, you you were using a meter with a hot LU. Yeah. Which is yeah. a positive so level. And then, you know, um, who's the other person it's it's both joe or pete lyman pete lyman mm -hmm. right those are the two that i go to and and they just get it yeah they really you know and there are times when they said flat yeah you know they know when it can be flat they know when they can stay out of the way and the other times when they can help and when they do it's awesome and and i'm really excited but i don't give much you know i give them Cup one or two one or two db yeah. And they don't have a problem with it because right. I'm doing it within the spec of what is going to be released. I mean, I get rough sometimes that are like at around five, yeah. uh, five lusts. That's the other side of the coin where like you, you can't is, choose yeah. the level because you can't deliver a mix that's quieter than a rough mix. Right. It will be perceived as worse. Right. Know? So we have to like, you know, I'll mix it at the proper level. But then when I send yeah. it out, I have to, we have to bump it yeah it's Choose just i mean so, and it's just there's no way that that's going to be measured at that level yeah that's something i've been struggling with lately it's just like it's, i'm getting it's hotter a, and hotter roughs and yeah minus five happened yeah. yeah and i was like i do i tell them it's just not going to come back that loud or i mean yeah so you guys are, well we we i mean how do you say it? i mean i i will say something and then he filters it uh-huh listen those <laughs> motherfuckers are like what the fuck you know you tell them kiss my ass you know and then fernando goes um Everything is great. Hi guys. Hi guys. <laughs> you know, can you, uh, you know, can you, can you understand that that that's beyond the mastering level? So what we're going to do is we're going to give you um, the level that that we've mixed it at, but we're also going to bump it up so you can compare it to your reference, but understand that you know, all nice. And I'm like, yeah, you tell him, man. You tell him. <laughs> I'd say, I'd say <laughs> like you're dictating what he's typing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, like this like filter. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, and he's like, I would say if we if we get a reference mix that's like up to like minus six lofts. Uh, we'll roll our eyes and sigh, but I'll I'll we'll match it. Mm -hmm. If you give me something that's louder than that, uh, we we've gotten like minus two. 
yeah. which is insane. Yeah. We we were not playing that game. Yeah. But then then the email comes. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And that one comes from Michael. No, 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 mine is like, what the fuck are you thinking about? What, two? Seriously? <laughs> Have you heard of a volume knob? I can hear it without hitting play. <laughs> you know how big your song is? This big. And, and you know, and what, what we've had to do even a couple of times with these like extreme cases is like explain it, but then we give them back the reference mix and I've gained down the reference mix yeah. and printed it. I'm like, you should use, this is your reference mix. I've just gained it down, but use this to compare to our mix because you can't compare with a 5 dB level difference. You know what yeah. I mean? So. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll bring the rough down. Right. And send it back to them. And like, this is your rough. That's the yeah. trick. Yeah. yeah. That was, yeah. yeah, that, you just came up with that recently. I was like, oh, brilliant. Right. And, brilliant. And I came up with that That's because, amazing. because of doing Atmos. Because Atmos is minus right. 18. Yeah. So instead of being like, hey, um, you know, because of Atmos, blah, blah, like explain why it's it's quote unquote so quiet. Yeah. But instead of leaving it in their hands, I'm just like, so here I'm giving you back your stereo master. Mm -hmm. I've just gained it down like 12 dB. So you, if you want to compare cool. your stereo to the to our Atmos, you know, yeah. you're you're game matched. Right. So right. then I trans use that. For stereo with with loud reference. Yeah, because I've done that for Atmos, but never thought about yeah. doing it with stereo. It was yeah. it worked yeah. like a charm. Now, okay, on um, uh, on our mix review platform uh, mixup.audio, we do have a loudness match on there. So I'm usually okay on there. But what I've found is like even when I deliver you know a mix up link to them, they're still pulling up their file. You know, of course. And like in music or whatever, and listening to that instead of listening to the ref that I put inside of mixup. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You have to educate them sometimes, you know. Yeah. But I, it, yeah. So yeah. he translates for me. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. He, tr he translates the proper language. Yeah. But, you know, I do that because I can just be, I could just be open to how I feel. I would never talk to a client like that. Sure. But, yeah. but, you know, when I want to just speak my mind, I can speak my mind to yeah. him and then, yeah. and, uh, and he gets the, ch and plus I'll get dramatic, yeah. you know, just for the fun of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But, and you guys have known each other for, well, exactly. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah, he gets time. it. Awesome. So I think that's going to be the last question because yeah, we, we have it. to get out of here and I got to yeah. pack all this stuff up, but Thanks so much yeah, for thank you. you know yeah. for thank you guys for awesome. um, you know for putting this together because here we are you know it, it it's a complex system and I'm so happy that so many of you have, you know have uh, committed to it and and enjoying it and it is a process and it takes time and that's why I thought today you know answering a lot of your questions will hopefully help you uh, understand this method a bit better and um again it's all about really it's just a tool to help you create to be more dynamic and emotional in your mix this is all about the song how can you make the song come alive and be more touching the listener um more touching okay forget the grammar but um <laughs> You understand that this is strictly a tool. And so without your creativity, it's, it remains a tool. But you do have to learn to understand that everything is about post-compression. And so there's three different stages. Um, and I think, you know, by explaining this a little bit more today, you have a better idea of where to start to make sure when things kind of go wrong, go back to this last episode and it I think that's pretty much will address your concern so thanks everybody thank you and awesome. um, happy mixing <laughs> <laughs>